Go ahead and call the meeting to order. This morning, our full committee hearing is on the fiscal year 2022 National Defense Authorization budget request for the Department of the Army. And we are joined by the Honorable Christine Ormuth, who is the, the Secretary of the Army, not an acting secretary. This is a momentous day for us. Um, so appreciate to have you there. And congratulations uh, on your confirmation and appointment. Uh, and General James McConville, uh, Chief of Staff of the US Army. Um, we are still doing a hybrid hearing, which means some members, as you will see, are participating virtually, and uh, we have rules for that. So I will read those rules and then we'll get started. Uh, members who are joining remotely must be visible on screen for the purposes of identity verification, establishing and maintaining a quorum, participating in the proceeding and voting. Those members must continue to use the software platform video function while in attendance unless they experience connectivity issues or other technical problems that render them unable to participate on camera. If a member experiences technical difficulties, they should contact the committee staff for assistance. Video of members' participation will be broadcast in the room and via the television internet feeds. Members participating remotely must seek recognition verbally and they are asked to mute their microphones when they are not speaking. Members who are participating remotely are reminded to keep the software platform's video function on the entire time they attend the proceeding. Members may leave and rejoin the proceeding. If members depart for a short while for reasons other than joining a different proceeding, they should leave the video function on. If members will be absent for a significant period or depart to join a different proceeding, they should exit the software platform entirely and then rejoin it if they return. Members may use the software platform's chat feature to communicate with staff regarding tactical or logistical support issues only. And finally, I have designated committee staff member to, if necessary, mute unrecognized members' microphones to cancel any inadvertent background noise that may disrupt the proceeding. Thank you and uh, greetings. Uh, we are, this is our last of the service um, posture hearing reviews and you know, there have been some themes that have been continuous throughout this. I think the biggest thing that, that I'm interested in this morning is the Army's modernization effort, um, starting with the, the night court and the blank slate review. There has been an intense effort, and, and not just by the Army, we've spoken with the other services as well, uh, to modernize the force, uh, to recognize changes in technology, changes in warfare, and to make sure that we are funding the appropriate systems uh, to meet those modernization needs, and also preparing the force in terms of readiness and training to meet those those needs and we would look forward to hearing uh, from both of you how that process is going and then really the the specifics um, what what does that mean I mean it all sounds good you always want to do what what's new and best but what does it mean in terms of how it is going to change the way we prepare to deter adversaries and the way that we would ultimately fight if we had to and what does it mean in terms of where we need to be spending our money and not spending our money uh, putting, putting meat on those bones, I think, is one of the most important things that our committee is trying to, to wrestle with as we get ready to pass the uh, NDAA for this year. Um, second, um, back focused on the force, um, the Fort Hood report that came out, uh, the continued concerns about sexual assault, again, um, across uh, the, the Pentagon, not just in the Army, but in particular, you know, Fort Hood was a particular problem um, that a report was filed on that really examined what's going on uh, with how we're treating our soldiers um, and protecting them. As you know, there are a number of proposals, particularly specific to sexual assault, that this committee is considering in part as a way to address those issues. And I'd be very curious to hear your um, comments about how you think we can best do that. Um, and also, this, this will come up, so I'll go ahead and mention it. Uh, the efforts to deal with systemic racism uh, and issues in the force. We know that Secretary Austin has made this priority. This, this committee has made this a uh, priority. We had a number of provisions in last year's bill that were focused on addressing uh, equality within the services and some adverse impacts that have been discovered in terms of administration of the UCMJ um, and also in terms of promotion. So we'd be curious to hear how you're addressing that issue. And to be clear, I think it is an issue that needs to be addressed. Um, we have been consumed with a debate over critical race theory, but that's not really the point. The point is we have systemic racism in this country. How are we going to address it? I'll be clear from what I understand about um, critical race theory, that is not the way we should, should be addressing it. Um, it's not the way Secretary Austin is addressing it. So we, we need to have that discussion and figure out how best to approach that because this is a real problem and a real challenge. 
We are a nation that is increasingly diverse, um, where communities of color are growing in numbers. That should be reflected in the force. In many ways, it is. But it should also be reflected in promotions. It should be reflected in leadership. It should be reflected in opportunities. And it certainly should be reflected in a fair and equitable way um, that, that punishment and rewards are administered within the service. And be really curious about how we're, how we're progressing on that and, and the direction that we're taking on those issues. Um, and finally, there is the top line budget. Um, there's a lot of controversy on this committee about that. It is my opinion that the President's budget is more than adequate to meet our national security needs. I have often expressed the opinion that sometimes a tighter budget actually gets a better result and incentivizes people to find the right answers that they need to find in what is always going to be a resource-constrained environment. Uh, I think we're in the right place on that. Not everybody agrees. Uh, but I'd be curious to hear, you know, your arguments for why you think this budget is adequate to meet your needs um, and how you're going to go about doing that. Uh, and with that, I will turn it over to the ranking member for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I want to thank the Secretary and uh, General McConville for being here. And it's very helpful, and we appreciate your time and effort. Uh, this is, as the Chairman said, our last uh, posture review hearing. Each of these hearings has made one thing very clear. The President's budget, defense budget is woefully inadequate. It falls uh, far short of providing our war fighters the resources they need to carry out their mission. Uh, we've heard from the leaders of the other services about the sacrifices they're being forced to make as a result of this budget. Today we'll hear the toll it is taking on the Army, and it's not pretty. The President's top line for defense is forcing the Army alone to slash funding by nearly $4 billion. That's in real dollars, $7.5 billion when adjusted for inflation. Uh, the Army is facing cuts of 12 percent in procurement, 10 percent in research and development, and 18 percent in MILCON. Like the leaders of the other services, Secretary Wormuth and General McConville have had to triage their limited budget allocation. They've decided to focus it on the Army's highest modernization priorities. Uh, there's no question that we need to make those investments. Uh, doing so ensures that we have the capabilities to win conflicts 10 or 20 years from now. But it also means it isn't sufficient uh, in, in the way of funding for near-term capabilities. In fact, the Army has nearly $5.5 billion in unfunded priorities. The budget cuts procurement of critical vertical lift and ground vehicle programs. It buys fewer missiles and ammunition to replenish our arsenal. And it delays the modernization of existing assets such as the Abrams tank. These cuts worsen current capability gaps. And I'm concerned it leaves the Army ill-prepared for near-term conflict. Uh, frankly, it's unacceptable. History has proven it's naive to think we have decades to prepare for the next conflict. The fact is the Army must be prepared at all times to fight and win a war against China or any other adversary. That means our war fighters need the training and capability to win the fight tonight. I'm very concerned this budget could leave the Army and the rest of the services unprepared to do just that. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. And before turning to our witnesses, I should remind members that we have, for the purpose of this hearing, questions will be going in reverse order. Um, we will go with the most junior member and work our way up from there. We tried to do that a couple of times. Um, so our committee is so large we can't get to everybody. Don't want to be excluding uh, the most uh, junior members all the time. So we're going to go from the bottom up today. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to Secretary Wormuth for her opening remarks. Thank you, Chairman Smith, Ranking Member Rogers, and distinguished members of the committee. Uh, we very much appreciate your continued support for our Army and our people. It's a real privilege to appear before you today. I'd like to take a minute to thank General McConville for his uh, lifetime of service to our Army and our nation. In my four weeks in the job, he's been a great partner, and we are off to a running start together. I'm honored to be serving as the Secretary of the Army and to be working with Secretary Austin and Deputy Secretary Hicks once again. I thank them for their continued leadership. As I've stepped into this role, I am impressed but not surprised to see the state of our Army and the professionalism, hard work, and continued sacrifice of our soldiers and leaders that make up the world's greatest land fighting force. I'd like to highlight a few key observations on the state of the Army as I see them today. First, the Army must continue to heavily invest in the development of its people, which are really the core and the heart of our Army. We're steadily working to enhance our force structure, build inclusive leadership, and invest in quality of life initiatives. 
Like my predecessors, I can assure you that character, culture, and climate within our formations at every installation will re reflect a continued focus on placing people first. The harmful behaviors of sexual assault and harassment, racism, and extremism cannot and will not be tolerated. We will purposely work to prevent suicide in our Army. Our responsibility is to ensure every soldier and civilian has the right leadership, policies, and resources to be safe and successful among their teams so that they can continue to be successful in our nation's defense. Second, the Army is now a leader in new technology. From Army Futures Command to cross-functional teams to the Rapid Capabilities and Critical Technologies Office to fielding next-generation soldier equipment for individual unit members, the Army is prototyping and experimenting with new capabilities and concepts. The Army is at the forefront of developing and fielding new technology, whether it is counter unmanned aerial systems, directed energy, hypersonic weapons, next generation assured position navigation and timing devices, pushing software coding to the edge, and in many other areas. Third, the Army is opening doors in the Indo-Pacific, Europe, and beyond. The Army can be relied upon to engage with our allies, foster partnerships, maintain deterrence, and set conditions for success prior to or while engaging in conflict. Deterrence requires boots on the ground, and the department must be present to succeed in crises. The Army is recognized as an enduring, reliable partner that can directly contribute by bringing resources, training, and expertise. Our partnerships can lay the groundwork for access and cooperation during contingencies. Fourth, the next conflict will be an all-domain conflict. Future conflict will be in, across, all domains with ground forces to secure terrain, penetrate defenses, and achieve objectives. The Army's transformation is directly aimed at supporting the joint war fight, and which will depend on the joint all-domain command and control concept, expeditionary joint logistics, and joint maneuver across domains. As the Army continues to modernize, we will maintain our overmatch against near-peer adversaries, helping to make future conflict less likely by ensuring the cost to our adversaries outweigh any benefits they might see. Finally, the Army's readiness gains and modernization requirements must be prioritized to continue. The Army recognized the need to modernize concepts and capabilities to sharpen our global competitive edge. Working in close cooperation with you, we established a deliberate, achievable path to deliver a ready, modernized Army. Significant progress has been made, but success can only be assured through continued transformation. The Army has already made and will continue to make tough decisions to ensure the best use of resources to adapt to and stay ahead of the capabilities of our adversaries, whether they are near peer competitors or newly emergent threats. The Army will also successfully compete below the threshold of conflict. The President's budget will help us care for our people, maintain and enhance military readiness, and innovate and modernize. With your continued support, we will pivot to next generation capabilities to ensure we can win now and in the future. Our Army is in great shape, but we have important work ahead. I want to use this window of opportunity in the next few years to make certain that the Army will continue to modernize, to provide modernized and ready forces capable of responding globally. I join General McConville in striving to ensure to provide the Army the resources it needs to succeed. I know General McConville is eager to share his thoughts as well, so I thank you and look forward to your questions. Thank you. Uh, General, you're recognized. Well, I'd like to thank the Secretary for 25 years plus of government service and, and for leading the Army at, at this critical time. So thank you, Secretary. Chairman Smith, Ranking Member Rogers, distinguished members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to be here today and for your continued support to the Army and our people, our soldiers, our families, our civilians, and our soldiers for life, our retirees and veterans. The Army currently has 485,000 active duty soldiers and a little more than one million in the total force. That is roughly the size Army that we had on 9-11. Army soldiers are presently supporting combatant commanders around the world in more than 140 countries. They form the most lethal and decisive land force in the world, and they stand ready to fight and win the nation's wars as part of the joint force. 
I could not be more proud of each and every one of them. Since last October, the Army's priorities have been people, readiness, and modernization, making us well aligned with the emerging national security guidance. Putting people first means recruiting and retaining the best talent a nation has to offer, maximizing their potential, and taking care of them. We are building a culture of cohesive teams that are highly trained, disciplined, and fit, where everyone is treated with dignity and respect. That is how we prevent the harmful behaviors to hurt our soldiers and break trust with the American people, these being sexual assault and harassment, acts of racism and extremism, and death by suicide. All three of my children, two sons and a daughter, plus my son-in-law, are currently serving in the Army. Providing a safe and secure environment for our soldiers is not only my responsibility as the Chief of Staff of the Army, it's also a deeply held personal commitment. We win through our people. The best fighting forces in the world ensure their soldiers and units are masters of their craft. That is why we are shifting to a foundational readiness model that prioritizes training at the company level and below first. The Army has rebuilt a high level readiness with the support of Congress, but that readiness level is fragile. We must sustain that high level readiness while continuing our most comprehensive transformation and modernization efforts in over 40 years. This is the only way we'll maintain our overmatch against near peer competitors and would be adversaries. This year, we are turning our multi-domain operations concepts into a real doctrine. We're not only developing, but we're delivering on our six modernization priorities, including our 31 plus four signature systems. With new doctrine, organizations, and equipment, the Army is offering multiple options to combatant commanders in multiple dilemmas to competitors and adversaries. And we are doing so along our sister services and alongside our allies and partners. The U.S. Army never fights alone. We are the strongest land force in the world, and a great source of that strength comes from our allies and partners. As a people-based organization, we are uniquely qualified to foster these relationships. Thank you for your continued support to American sons and daughters in uniform. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. What, so what, what is your key takeaway from the Fort Hood report and from what happened there? And I think you mentioned it in your opening remarks, what the overall problem is in terms of it's not just sexual assault. We've got suicide problems. We've got, we've got a real problem seemingly relating um, to the service members out there and making sure that they're, they're safe and protected. Um, but in terms of action items, what do you think is most important to do in response to that for both of you? So, Madam Secretary, you can go first. Chairman, uh, I would say, first of all, I went down to Fort Hood a couple of weeks ago to see, see for myself and to talk to soldiers, and I talked to a, a small group of soldiers privately to hear from them candidly. I, I think the, uh, the biggest insight for me out of the report is the fact that, you know, for the last 20 years, the Army has been enormously busy. The op tempo has been very high. Our leaders have been, they've had a lot to do. They've been focused on deployments and training. And I think it's made it harder to then, you know, do what they need to do to care for our soldiers. And so really what we have to do is uh, make sure that our command climate at the lowest possible level is healthy. And we have a number of initiatives to get after that. But I think fundamentally what the, ch what the uh, chief and I are trying to emphasize with the sergeant major is building cohesive teams and taking care of your squad mates. And so uh, what we're going to be focusing on is really trying to build that kind of a culture so that people are taking care of themselves, leaders are taking care of soldiers, and soldiers are looking out for each other. But it's going to take time, I think, to make significant progress in this area. General. Uh, yes, yes, Chairman. And I agree with the Secretary. You know, one of the things that I took away, and I went down and, and talked to the troops at Fort Hood. I served uh, in the 1st Cavalry Division in, in combat during uh, 2004 to 2005, as many of the, the senior leaders in the United States Army. What, what, what I took away was, at the lowest levels, it, it seemed that leaders were not spending time to really know their soldiers, to find out what was going on in that group of soldiers that are 17 to 24 year olds. And when we study the problems we have, most of the problems occur with new soldiers, 17 to 24 year olds coming in to our organizations and they live in these things we call squads. 
And that's why the Sergeant Major of the Army is going after to get squad leaders building what, what, what I call a golden triangle where everyone treats everyone else with dignity and respect within that squad, where everyone knows their squad makes, everyone takes care of each other, and they understand the importance of having a cohesive organization that allows them to fight and win on the battlefield. But one of the things I talked about in my open station, statement was foundational readiness. We have got to give time for junior leaders to spend time with their soldiers and have a chance to train them, have a chance to uh, get to know each other in a way that we haven't seen. And quite frankly, some of these younger leaders, we have to teach them how to care for their soldiers and how to treat, develop a climate where they're all treated with dignity and respect. We're going after that, but we're also going after the leaders. The leaders are responsible for the culture and climate in their organization. We have an assessment program, a command assessment program for battalion commanders and colonel command assessment. That's all part of it. We've got multiple other things going on to determine what is the climate like. Not compliance like how many of these or how many of those you have, but what's going on on those junior levels where most of the issues that I see happen in the Army. No, I think both, both your answers are, are spot on, and that is the key, is you sort of lost touch. I think there's a, a general feeling of, go do your job, and you'll be fine. Um, and there needs to be a far higher level of engagement. And also, this is my fault on the question. I want to make sure it wasn't misleading. It's not just Fort Hood. Um, Fort Hood got the attention, but you look at some of the statistics, there are other major bases that, you know, the numbers are really not that different in terms of suicide, sexual assault, uh, and problems with personnel. So it is comprehensive, and I, and I appreciate your approach on that. Um, Mr. Rogers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, General McConville, in your letter accompanying the Army's unfunded uh, mandate, un unfunded requirement list, you acknowledge the President's budget creates, quote, a downturn in Army's purchasing power, close quote. And you also informed us that, quote, progress is at risk if you don't have real growth of 3 to 5 3 to five percent above inflation going forward. Uh, can you elaborate on that and uh, tell us if we pass a budget that fails to, at, at a minimum, keep uh, r pace with inflation, hopefully with an increase, uh, what Army capabilities or programs are at risk? Yeah, and, and Congress, what, what we've done uh, within the budget is, is try to produce the, the best army we can within uh, the, the resources we have. Uh, that's an army that's uh, 485,000 end strength. We were growing end strength. We're not going to be able to grow end strength, so we're basically uh, keeping the end strength that we have, which I articulated was at the level of 9-11. We're keeping uh, a basic level of readiness. We do not want to go back to where we were a couple of years ago, where the readiness of the Army uh, was of concern. I believe right now the, the Army is ready to fight and win. But most importantly, what, what I think we have to do is we must transform the Army now for the next 40 years. And I make the argument every 40 years we transform the Army. We did in 1940. We did in 1980 when I came in the Army. We're in 2020 right now. And so we have done everything we can to protect those modernization priorities, those 31 plus four systems. And if you'll see it in, 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 in my UFA list, there's other things that are not gonna get funded that we, we would like to do. We, got, we have challenge with barracks, we have challenge with what I call enduring systems that we would like to bring along uh, in the system. And those are listed in, in the UFA. But make no mistake to those who listen to this, the Army can fight and win today. Yeah, it, and, and we're all mindful of that, but we also know you got to get ready for the future. Uh, so what do you need that this budget does not buy you? Well, I think when, when we, we talk about needs, uh, the reason you ask us to provide a unfunded requirement letter, which, which we did, uh, that shows some of the, the requirements that were not included in, in the budget. Uh, the only thing I would ask is, we have a prioritized budget. Everything in the budget is what we need. Uh, those are additional priority type items, and I would ask that if there's any, um, as we look at that, especially when it comes to our readiness accounts, we have um, really gone after them hard to make sure they're as efficient and effective as, as we can. You know, I just, uh, as I mentioned in my opening statement, we can't lose sight of the fact that this year's budget gives you seven and a half billion dollars less in buying power than you had in the previous year's budget. Uh, when you look at China, and we all acknowledge China is, uh, is a peer now that we have to be thoughtful about. Uh, as they ramp up their defense funding, what do you worry about them outpacing you on in the near future? 
Well, they, they have a great economy. Uh, they have, uh, you know, when we take a look at uh, China itself, is a very, very strong economy. Uh, they have a force that's much larger than ours historically, they've, especially when we look at an, an army. Uh, they have a, a, an active duty army that's probably twice the size of ours. And as they modernize it, uh, we need to stay ahead of them. And that's what we intend to do. That's why our 31 plus 4 modernization priorities are so important. They give us the speed, the range, and the convergence to give us decision dominance and, quite frankly, overmatch. And so as we move forward, we are doing everything we can to protect those modernization priorities. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you. Mr. Horsford is recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and to the ranking member uh, for the courtesy of going in, in reverse order. And I want to thank our witnesses uh, for your service and testimony uh, today. I was deeply concerned uh, by recent media reporting that at least 1,900 weapons, including machine guns and rocket launchers, had been lost or stolen from arms rooms over the course of the last decade. Some of, some of these weapons went on to be used in violent crimes. While I'm, of course, troubled by the fact that this was brought to our attention through media reporting, instead of a formalized reporting requirement, I'm more concerned about the broader readiness is issues it pretends. I, I firmly believe that arms rule rooms are the single best indicator of a unit's readiness. We can learn nearly everything we need about a unit's maintenance systems, accountability, and ultimately combat readiness through the processes implemented in the arms rooms. For that reason, I'm concerned that the loss of such a staggering number of weapons could indicate more systemic readiness and accountability, accountability issues across the Army. Secretary Wormuth and, and General uh, McConville, first, what steps is the Army taking to implement systemic fixes to weapons accountability and to modernize inventory control for sensitive items? And second, can you please update us on your investigation into these reports and any trends the Army has identified in units or installations where these weapons have gone missing? Certainly, Congressman. Uh, first of all, you know, we, we take weapons accountability in the Army incredibly seriously, and soldiers are, uh, you know, trained to be very responsible, and any time there is a, a, a lack of accountability or a loss of a, a potential loss of a weapon, uh, you know, the entire unit focuses to, to find out what has happened and to retrieve it. What we've done in terms of trying to better understand the situation is we have stood up uh, essentially a, a task force that's led by a three-star general uh, to dig into this. And what we found so far is that out of about 1.1 million weapons army-wide, uh, we have only been able to identify since 2013 384 uh, instances of a weapon going missing. And uh, to date, I would say it is not apparent to us that there is a particular trend that is behind the loss or of accountability. For example, in uh, I think 2019, we had 83 weapons missing, and last year we had only 10. But we are trying to look into it and identify if we have any systemic issues, as you noted, uh, and, and we'll take action on that if, if we find that there are systemic issues. Thank you. I look forward to hearing more about that. I'd like to move on now to the issue of sexual assault and specifically how the Army plans to hold commanders accountable for their performance in reducing sexual harassment and sexual assault. While I fully support efforts to move sexual assault prosecutions outside of the chain of command, there is a clear and urgent need to improve accountability among senior leaders for their effectiveness in combating sexual assault and assault within their formations. Uh, Secretary Womack, uh, how does the Army intend to collect metrics that track the performance of senior leaders at implementing effective, sharp programs and then hold them accountable for their performance during pr promotion and command selection decisions? Congressman, uh First of all, as you know, the Army uh, took the action of suspending or relieving 14 officers uh, in the wake of the Fort Hood uh, Independent Review Committee. Going forward, we are going to be, again, we are putting tremendous emphasis on 
creating a healthy command climate. And it is the responsibility of our leaders in the Army to maintain that command climate. One of the, we are fundamentally redesigning our SHARP program, for example. We are also reorganizing our criminal investigative division and we'll have a civilian leader of that division, uh, likely with law enforcement background. One of the things that we're doing to hold our leaders accountable is through our command assessment program. This is a new program that the Army has to help us select battalion commanders, colonels, uh, sergeant majors, acquisition officials, and as part of that 360-degree um, review performance process, we are taking into account past command climate performance. So through, again, a series of sort of a, a multi-day screening process, we are evaluating future leaders, and part of that evaluation rests on how well they're doing in terms of command climate. And the chief may want to add to that. No, I think, I, I I think it's extreme. I apologize. I wasn't paying attention. The gentleman's time has expired. Okay. Um, and I should warn the witnesses that when we do this, even if you're in the middle of a question, we try to move on so that we can get as, to as many members as possible. Um, Mr. Fallon is recognized for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. I apologize for not being there in person, but a virus other than COVID has uh, gotten me for a few days. Um, thank you, General uh, McConville and Secretary Warmoth for testifying today and for both of your decades of service to our country. Uh, General Kava, if I can start with you first, I know that we share a passion for our soldiers, their safety and their well-being, and really their, their development as well. And I want to applaud your track record of emphasizing personnel issues. Um, in short, you have a tremendous affection for the troops and that shows through your actions. Um, that in that vein, I'd like to ask um, and to address a current situation the Army finds itself in with um, that could be interpreted as unfortunately neglecting soldier safety and unnecessarily wasting wasting taxpayer money. What I'm referring to is the Humvee. Uh, 150 of our soldiers have been killed in um, stateside accidents, preventable Humvee rollovers during training. I know that you find this just as unacceptable and as important as I do. To address this, the Army has developed a plan to simultaneously introduce new Humvees to the fleet uh, while upgrading existing vehicles with uh, the Army uh, already considers new or modernized. Additionally, the Army is fielding replacement for the Humvee, the JLTV, with an anti-rollover technology already installed. And I, I support this above uh, this overall uh, approach. However, I was extremely concerned when I saw the budget request with a mere $10 million in funding the upgrades because the upgrades are much cheaper and we can do them quicker. With the $10 million amounts to only upgrading 1% of the 54,000 vehicle fleet and retrofitting and rendering them safe, it's quicker and it's cheaper. This gap can't be filled by only new vehicles, which it really does translate, in my humble opinion, to putting soldiers' lives at risk without critical safety upgrades. Uh, as I mentioned, the cost for fielding a new MV is about 400 grand and upgrading 17,000. <clears throat> General, with this in mind, is the, uh, why do you think the Army appears to be content to pursue what some could say would be a less safe path and a more expensive one? And I'd really like to hear your thoughts on this, sir. Well, Congress, I appreciate the concern. And as you said, we, we have a tremendous concern for the life, health, and safety uh, of our soldiers. Uh, we do have a strategy, and, and, and quite frankly, if, if, if we'll take your comments and take a look at that strategy. But like you said, that is what we are doing. We are taking existing ve ve um, vehicles and, and putting the new braking system on them. We are also purchasing new Humvees. And the third is which we're really trying to get to is, is the joint light tactical vehicle uh, within the resources we have. But I'll go back and take a look at that. Is if there's a life health safety issue, that's something we can we can get after. Uh, General, what would need to happen to ensure the the program could be completed as quickly as possible? Because it seems to me retrofitting would be quicker than waiting for new Humvees to come online. And I understand that if we have very old Humvees, it's probably not wise to retrofit them. It'd just be easier to replace them. But some of the newer ones, uh, or the ones that have you know about half their life left, might make it until the JLTV. Well, I'll, I owe you a, a better answer, Congressman, to take a look at that. I mean, the intent, just like you said, some of our Humvees are, 
really old. Uh, they've been around a long time, and quite frankly, yeah. we don't want to invest in them because that we may be fixing one safety issue, but we may be going into another safety issue. And so we, we, we owe uh, a look at that. We certainly want to make sure that, that every system our soldiers have, uh, especially when it comes to life, health, and safety. Uh, we're not going to put our soldiers in something that's unsafe. And we just got to figure out the best way to do it. You brought up a good point, and we'll take a look at it. General, thank you. Secretary Warmoth, uh, in a, I just want to let you know that in a, a letter dated May 1st, me, myself, and 13 of my colleagues wrote a letter to then acting secretary uh, of the Army, Whitley, about my concerns that I just talked to the general about. And I just wanted to make you aware of it as well. And then in closing, and I'll yield back, um, there was a comment made earlier about the fact that there is systemic racism in this country. And I just want to, for the record, say that uh, I respectfully but patently and vociferously uh, disagree. But that is a, a topic and a conversation and a debate for another day. Thank you, Mr. Chair, I appreciate it, and I yield back. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Murphy is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and um, thank you to Secretary Warmoth and General McConville for being here with us today, as well as for your service to our country. Um, I serve as the Vice Chair of the Subcommittee that oversees uh, U.S. Special Operations Forces, and I wanted to um, start by asking you a bit about them. Um, as with um, the broader military, uh, our um, special operators have been primarily focused on combating violent extremism since uh, September 11th, but they're now rebalancing to focus more on great power competition with countries like China, Russia, and Iran. So could you describe a little bit um, as to how you're adapting recruitment and training to help prepare for this mission? Um, and, and I'm particularly interested in your special forces groups, um, civil affairs units, and psychological operations units. Um, which I think all have a, a pretty important role to play when it comes to working with foreign governments, foreign militaries, foreign populations in that context of great power competition. Thank you, Congresswoman. Uh, I'll, I'll start and then I'm sure the chief will want to add. As you said, our, our special operators, uh, like, like special operators and other services, have been focused on uh, counterinsurgency and counterterrorism for the last 20 years, but we're now shifting to uh, strategic competition with China and Russia in particular. And I think in that context, uh, there's very much still going to be a need for the kinds of skills and expertise that our special forces have to offer. Uh, one way we will be, you know, first of all, we are um, rethinking our overall strategy for the special operations community. And uh, there, is, there is an irregular warfare annex to the existing national defense strategy. What we've started to do is to look at the scenarios that we're using and the types of exercises that we're using and are, are changing the elements of that to align to the kinds of things we might see in strategic competition. So I think you'll see us you know, putting an emphasis on unconventional warfare, on information operations, as you said, you know, psychological operations. Uh, those are all going to be things um, that are relevant to, you know, what some people call hybrid warfare or, you know, gray zone conflict. And those are things where our special forces are still going to be very much needed. And I'll let the chief add. I think you ask a great question. I just want to highlight what an incredible job our special forces operations have done over the last 20 years. Uh, they, they have just done an incredible job. And, 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 the, and the great thing about our special forces, they're agile and they're adaptable. They clearly understand. I've talked to General Rich Clark. I've talked to Fran Baudet. I've talked to the leadership down there. Um, you know, counterterrorism is not going away. We're still going to have these type issues. We still have going to have counterinsurgency type operations. We're still going to have a regular warfare. That is not going away. But what you're going to see is I think the groups are going to shift and they're going to focus more on the combatant region that they're actually operating. Most of them have just been rotating in and out of Afghanistan and Iraq and done an incredible job doing that. But the focus is going to change because the strength in this area of strategic competition becomes from having strong allies and partners. And our special forces are uniquely suited to do that, to work with allies and partners, to build capacities, and also to help them build their capacity in the special forces arena, because a lot of these countries have issues with violent extremists, and quite frankly, we'd rather have them provide their security than I, than I do it. And I, I would highlight things like information operations uh, are, are, are something that we're really going to have to be able to work in the future. And I see them having a very strong participation in that, in that also. But there's going to be plenty of work for special forces. They're critical to the future of the country. 
I appreciate you bringing that up, actually, and maybe we can focus on the Indo-PACOM AOR. I noticed that the Army is requesting an additional $20 million above the baseline for security force assistance brigade activities across the Indo-Pacific. Um, can you talk a little bit more about uh, what these brigades have done, uh, have achieved in other regions and how they're going to be used in the Indo-Pacific? Yeah, I'll, I'll take that. Yeah, what we're seeing is, you know, we, we talk about a strategy of peace through strength, and that, that peace through strength comes from a holistic uh, government approach, a strong military, and certainly a strong uh, army, but it also comes through strong allies and partners. And when I look at the Security Force Assistance Brigades, they are designed to help improve the, the capabilities of um, conventional forces within these countries. And if you go out, you know, a lot of people talk about what's the role of the Army in the Indo-Pacific. Well, most of the people out there live on land, and most of them have armies that need the capacity to secure themselves. Special Forces also plays a critical role. Uh, they provide unique skill sets. They're, they're, they're fabulous in developing uh, more high-end type forces, where they're, they're, they're the special operation forces that can help them uh, some of these countries have problems with terrorists, some problem have problems with insurgents, and they can help develop and I uh, those apologize, internal the to do that. time has expired, uh, so we'll have to leave it there. And uh, Mr. Moore is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman, Ranking Member. Uh, I, too, uh, love the reverse order, so thank you. Secretary General, I appreciate you being here. I, uh, I was encouraged to see the Army Material Command earlier this year issue the 15-year Army Organic Industrial-Based Modernization Strategy. I agree, with, I agree with General Daly, AMC commander, that now is the time for wholesale change, and the OIB is an inflection point. How the next 10 to 15 years are handled will determine the depot's ability to maintain pace with the Army's next generation weapon systems. As co-chair of the House Depot Caucus, I have voiced the need to expedite other OI, OI, OIB modernization plans across the services to fit the objectives of the national defense strategy. Um, Secretary, I'll direct my questions to you, but General, absolutely welcome any input. Uh, is, can you provide an update on the modernization strategy, the Army OIB modernization strategy, and how you think it can be accomplished in 15 years? Certainly, Congressman. Uh, as you said, General Daly and Materiel Command are, are embarking on a 15-year um, or, organic industrial-based plan. Our hope is that that will be completed at about um, this time next year. And really what we're trying to do there is um, a couple of different things. You know, first of all, as we undertake this um, you know, first in 40 years ambitious modernization program, we need to make sure that the industrial base is going to be able to support all of those next generation weapons. So part of what we're looking at in the plan is, um, is assessing, first of all, the current industrial base and whether it will be able to meet our needs, and then identifying any kinds of gaps that we need to fill to be able to, again, make sure that we're able to support these new systems over time. Another important thread in the 15-year um, plan is frankly looking at our supply chain, uh, which I think the pandemic experience has shown us is, is perhaps more fragile than we would like it to be. We're trying to identify where we may have potential single points of failure in the industrial base. We're trying to identify where we have foreign suppliers, understanding you know, uh, our confidence level with those foreign suppliers, trying to identify if there are foreign suppliers that frankly we don't want to be purchasing from in the future. So those are all issues that we are looking at, uh, as well as you know, how we may need to bring in some new manufacturing capabilities, again, into our existing base to support the next generation programs. Excellent. Just any, any particular comment on the 15 year? Do you feel that there's a chance that could be accelerated? Do you feel that that was, uh, you know, any insight into 15 years, why it was chosen? Is there, was there enough research and, and thought going into that particular timeline? Well, uh, I would imagine, I mean, having not been there when it was originally decided to undertake the plan, I think what we're trying to do is um, move as quickly as we can, because obviously we want to uh, modernize our industrial base as quickly as we can, but also do it in a way, frankly, that we can support with our resources, but also are able to support in terms of the kind of analysis and the kind of redesigns that may be needed. So I think we would look for opportunities to accelerate that modernization plan where we can, but we have to look at that in the context of our overall resources and other other objectives that we have, for example, in terms of readiness and supporting our people. And you, as you've mentioned, um, some advanced manufacturing, I'll add in advanced sensors, robotics, computer programming machine types of things. 
Um, those are expensive. There's always going to be budget constraints. What can our what can this committee do to make sure that we don't um, run into to, to similar delays or, or, or unnecessary delays in this modernization plan? Well, I think, Congressman, again, you know, your just your continued um, reliable support for our modernization efforts would be very helpful. Uh, there may be times where we may come to you to ask for additional authorities. For example, I mean, right now, I don't think that we need additional authorities. But for example, you know, we. We have been given authorities uh, in terms of science and technology hires that have been very helpful to us in terms of bringing in civilian expertise in computer science and neuroscience. So, so I can imagine that might be a way where you can support us over time. But right now, I think we have what we need. Excellent. General, anything to add? I, I think the, the importance of the 15-year plan is to lay out, you know, um, the whole problem set. As you know, if we, if we just went a three or four year plan, we, we, the resources are not going to be available, but that allows everyone to take a look. Here's, here's how we see things come in the future. And the other thing I think is important uh, to encourage the depots to modernize. You know, we're going to have new systems coming in. We can take a look at here's how these, you know, as future vertical lift comes on board, as our long range precision fires, as our next generation combat weapons come. If we're looking out in the future, we can start to program them in and get them the equipment that's going to keep them uh, effective and efficiently in the future because many of our depots yeah. and some Again, of our arsenals I've, have been around for yeah, 40 years. Sorry, Thank you, John. Time has Thank expired. You, uh, Mr. Panetta is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Rogers, Madam Secretary General. Uh, good morning, and thank you for being here. Thank you for your service. Um, just going to try to hit on three areas, Mil military housing, COVID vaccines, and our posture in Africa. Uh, in regards to military housing, um, uh, where I represent on the central coast of California, um, we have a, uh, our military contracts with private contractors uh, in order to uh, have our military families in privatized housing. Um, unfortunately, there are times when that housing really is subpar. Uh, and the biggest issue, I got to say, is mold and how that can affect not just the military member, but of course the family members and unfortunately the children as well, um, uh, amongst other issues too. I would just wanted to get your take on um, how the Army is holding private contractors responsible, how they're holding them accountable for their actions or inactions uh, when it comes to providing the subpar military housing. Like that, look, it doesn't happen everywhere. We know that. But I believe that one house that has mold in it is one too many. And so I was just wondering if there's anything else that we can do to ensure to hold these private contractors responsible. Thank you, Congressman. I absolutely agree with you that we want our soldiers and their families to live in housing that we would want to live in. Uh, and to do that, the Army has done a few things. I mean, first of all, we've put responsibility for the privatized housing oversight of that um, under, under AMC. And uh, the commander of Installations Command meets every single month with the heads of all of the, the companies who do our privatized housing to go through household by household the status of you know, where we're making repairs, where we're making renovations. We have uh, changed, frankly, you know, how we've been uh, paying those companies. We don't pay incentive fees up front anymore. We pay them at the end when we're satisfied that they're performing. Mm -hmm. And we've also uh, now implemented the ten all 18 provisions of the Tenant Bill of Rights in 37 of the 44 installations where we have privatized housing. And we'll have the last seven done, we hope, by the end of July. Great. I think and if you're talking Fort Ord, that was my first assignment. So <laughs> There are some places. houses there at Fort Ord, exactly. But, you know, we, we need to invest in the house. You know, we, we've taken a look. We know what housing is good, and, and we've done much better in the work orders. We've done much better in those type things. But some of these houses, quite frankly, have got to uh, be replaced. And we're working uh, with the private contractors to do that. They have take, take, um, raised additional money. We've got a little over a couple of billion dollars starting to go in that. But, but we've got to have a long-term... Uh, program to do that, and what, that's what we're trying to work right now. Outstanding. Thanks to both of you for answer, for those answers. Um, moving on to vaccines, what percentage of the Army personnel are fully vaccinated in regards to the COVID vaccine? Congressman, I believe at this point we have 63% uh, of the active component has had at least one shot, and I think we are at about 55% who are fully vaccinated at this time. What can we do, what can you do to ensure full vaccination going forward or to increase those numbers? I think the most important thing we can do, Congressman, is, is what we've been doing, which is to 
uh, really explain the benefits of the vaccine to our soldiers and their families. And when we give them that additional educational information, we see more of them getting the shots. And frankly, as, as their peers have started getting the shots, we see more soldiers getting the shots. But part of the challenge is, you know, a lot of our soldiers are younger uh, and I think, you know, feel, feel a little bit invincible as a result of that. So we still have work to do because certainly I think it would be beneficial to have as much of the force fully vaccinated as possible. What, what, how do you feel about a mandatory vaccine uh, in regards to the COVID vaccine? I mean, is that something that uh, you feel obviously it would increase the numbers, but how, what, what would that do to morale? Um, Congressman, I think, you know, I have not looked at this in detail in terms of what the implications are, what our legal authorities are, uh, but, but certainly, you know, we have, we have made vaccines mandatory in the past. Uh, right now, we have an emergency use authorization from FDA, so, so we can't do that. Exactly. Um, but, but over time, I would look at that if, if we didn't continue to see the percentage increase, but we are seeing that percentage of our force uh, increase. General? No, I agree with the secretary. I think um, you know right now it's emergency use. I think once it, if it, you know, and we see that moving forward, maybe the next couple of months that comes out where it's uh, fully accepted, then we can have that discussion on what's the best way to do it. But I, I agree with the secretary. We, you know, we, we think it's in everyone's interest that you know does not have underlying conditions as part of the team. You know, we, we're seeing the effects right now. I mean, the fact we're sitting here, you know, has a lot to do with folks like General Gus Perner and, and, and the team that, you know, got these out and, and did a great job of doing that. So I think, um, you know, people worried about the speed of, of the vaccinations, but I, I, I again, I'm, I'm, I'm all signed up. So. Thank you, yeah, Jake, Thanks to both Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Fired. Uh, Mr. Jackson is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Rogers for holding the hearing today. I also want to thank Secretary Wormuth and uh, General McConnell for being here. Thank you, sir. Uh, each branch of the military has testified before this committee on the president's budget request, and each has explained how the budget cuts are not impacting their services readiness and modernization efforts. I don't need to explain to either one of you, obviously, that the Army it was the hardest hit by President Biden's budget cut with a decrease in funding from last fiscal year and a decrease in end strength. Not only does this not align with the 3 to 5 percent growth called for in the national defense strategy, but it will make it much harder for us to compete with China. I appreciate both of your efforts to justify this budget cut as acceptable, but I firmly believe that this request from President Biden is inadequate. Of the countless modernization priorities that we need to focus on, I want to spend a little bit of time uh, talking about the future vertical lift, one of the Army's six modernization priorities. The future long-range assault aircraft, or the FLURA, will be a medium-lift aircraft that will eventually replace, re replace the Black Hawk. The future attack and reconnaissance aircraft is the Army's third attempt over the past two decades to develop a new attack and reconnaissance helicopter. Both of these are part of the critical future vertical lift modernization effort that will help us compete with China and the Indo-Pacific in particular. The FLURA is a modernization program that the Army needs, in my opinion. The Army has consistently discussed the need for speed and range as well as survivability when it comes to future vertical aircraft vertical lift aircraft. There are countless reasons as to why we need to provide adequate funding for this program, but I want to discuss the medevac mission uh, in this platform that, as it takes over for the H-60. In a theater like the Indo-Pacific, it will be critical to have aircraft with speed and range necessary to transport an injured soldier. I've been in the combat zone. I've seen firsthand how speed and range of, med of medevac aircraft are key components of whether or not somebody's life is saved. The golden hour is a concept that presumes that some deaths are preventable if appropriate care is provided in a timely fashion. It's imperative that we not only extend the golden hour radius, but the aircraft supporting the medevac mission should be able to give injured soldiers the best chance for survival in the event of an injury in the combat zone. When it comes to medevac, every second obviously matters. Future vertical lift and future long-range assault aircraft will provide increased speed, range, and endurance. General McConnell, I know that you're an aviator. How important are speed and range when it comes to a commander's ability to medevac an injured soldier, and how critical is that exponential jump in capability associated with this new platform with regards to medevac in the golden hour, and specifically when looking at the Indo-Pacific theater? Yeah, I think it's absolutely uh, critical, Congressman. You know, the, the, the point you made, it's absolutely critical to be able to medevac our, our soldiers, and we want to be able to do that. But what's interesting is you take a look at what, what does the range allow you to do? Uh, with the golden hour, you basically, when you're looking about having troops out there, we have some leaders right here that have commanded troops in combat. And what happens is, you, you, if, you, if you can only go 
100 miles an hour, then quite frankly, uh, you can only have troops out so far from that base. And from that base, you have to have a uh, forward surgical team, they have to protect it. So you're putting a whole bunch of troops on the battlefield just to create that capability for medevac, which we want to do. By having this capability, you provide much, much more options to that ground commander. And, and I, I'm fully in support of making this happen. But more importantly, what I'm full in support is the way industry is aggressively going after that, working with us. That we are flying before we're buying. We're very concerned about being very efficient the way we do this. We've got in industry teams invested into this capability, and I think it's something we need for the future. Yes, sir, I agree with you 100%. Obviously, I think it's a game changer, and I, I just had some data here. Uh, obviously, it cre increases the speed uh, from 120 knots to 280 knots. It increases the maximum radius from 109 nautical miles to 230 nautical miles, and it decreases the, go the golden hour radius from 110 or from 46 nautical miles, it, it pushes it out to 110 nautical miles. So I think it's an absolute game changer. I thank you for your response. I look forward to working with each of you and my colleagues here on the committee to address the evolving threats that we face and to provide our young men and women the training, the resources, and everything they need to accomplish their mission. Thank you. With that, I yield back, sir. Thank you, Mr. Vesey is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate the reverse order. Likewise. Uh, Secretary Warmuth, in your confirmation uh, hearing uh, to the Senate Armed Services Committee, you confirmed that the long-range precision fire is still the Army's number one uh, modernization priority with particularly uh, importance in the uh, Indo-Pacific region uh, and Russia. Uh, my concern is that the Army may not be considering the modernization priority for, enabling, for the enabling capabilities required to have a successful kill chain. What is the Army doing uh, to ensure airborne deep sensing capabilities that include uh, both uh, uh, Signet and are sufficient to meet the uh, LRPF requirement and other demands uh, in the Pacific and in Europe. Thank you, Congressman. Uh, you know, first of all, people like to prioritize, but the way I look at our modernization program, we really need to comprehensively modernize. And we have sort of six focus areas of which long-range precision fires is one. Um, but, but equally important is our uh, network portfolio area, for example, because again, to your point, we have to be able to connect our sensors and shooters together. We have to be able to defend those systems and our forces um, from from aerial and missile defense fires. So for example, you know, integrated air and missile defense is another portfolio area that we're emphasizing. So I, uh, and, and in our budget, you know, we have put 74% of our RDT&E funds towards the 31 plus four modernization and we've worked very hard to protect the whole suite of next generation capability areas. So um, while the long-range precision fires, I think, is a very important capability, both in Indo-PACOM and Europe, we absolutely need those other areas to be modernized as well to be able to be successful and to be able to contribute to the joint force. Thank you very much. Uh, General McConville, uh, I was just at Fort Hood uh, on a coat ale about a month ago, uh, and uh, and and we were talking about the sexual assault and, and, and how the Army is trying to root out racism. And it occurred to me, I was, just, I was watching a program not, uh, from 1964, and they were interviewing these people in this small southern town to ask them what they thought about the 1964 Civil Rights Bill. And I thought it was important because these people, they weren't in the Klan, they weren't a part of any other hate group, they were, they were people that were going to the grocery store, they were part of the Baptist church, they were just everyday Americans. And their answer was, the black people already have civil rights. I don't understand uh, why we need to talk about equality. Black people already have equal rights. And they were serious. They weren't like, you know, saying it just to be saying it. And again, they were just normal people. And so when you hear people today say that there's no systematic racism, it's really not a surprise. It's really a continuation from people just living their everyday lives and, 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 and not having to experience that themselves. And so, we heard a lot of uh, stories from women uh, and soldiers of color. How do you, with, with, that, with that sort of microaggression, how do you root that out? How, how do you work with the generals to make sure that people are really taking this seriously? Because there's just going to be that resistance. And even though those people in 1964, they, even though it was blatant segregation, it said colored bathrooms, white bathrooms, 
they were very serious when they were looking into that camera saying, black people already have equal rights. And so if when it's that ingrained, how do you really get to the root of it to make sure that the workplace is, is good? Because one of the things that the soldiers told us when we had off the records with them, when you decide to re-up, if, if you have a commander or a non-commissioned officer that's supportive of you, that may be the de determining factor in whether or not you decide to re-up. If you have someone that's not going to be supportive of you, you're probably not going to re-up. Now, I, I think that um, Congressman, you know, at least what we're trying to do in the Army and, and really get down to the, the lowest level is building a cohesive team where everyone treats everyone with dignity and respect and, and everyone takes care of each other. And well, how do you do that? I mean, some of it's just having a basic conversation about you know, where you're from, what's your story, um, and, and having those discussions where you build this, this team because what's really important uh, in the military is you're going to fight uh, with your brothers and sisters, and you want everyone, you know, I, I used an example, you, you know you got cohesion right uh, in your team when every single soldier is willing to run through withering fire to get you when you're being carried away by the Taliban. That's what Sal Junta did in the 173rd, but that's the type of attitude you want inside uh, your organization. The ge and gentleman's time ha has, has expired. I think that's very important discussion. Um, Ms. McClain. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ranking Mem Member Rogers. And, and thank you both for, for being here. Um, I want to speak on the issue of China and the steps that the Army is taking to prepare for any eventualities. Ma Madam Secretary, your budget request to this committee has requested several cuts in different departments. You request a cut in total forces from fiscal year 21's current projected levels, and even a cut in the procurement of um, munitions. As China continues to spend billions on building up its military, why are we requesting a cut in force strength and munition, munition procurements? It seems like they're going this way on spending and we're going this way. And every hearing that I'm in, China's our number one threat. China's our number one threat. Yet we continue to spend less and less money, and they continue to spend more and more. It's very concerning. Congresswoman, thank you. Um, first of all, you know, I, I am very concerned about China's comprehensive modernization and the breadth of its modernization over the last 20 years. They've, they've definitely um, taken advantage of the time that we've been in Iraq and Afghanistan to, to, to build their military up quite a bit. I think what I would say is, you know, what's, what's most important in my view in terms of our ability to stay ahead of China, and I think it's very important to underscore, as the chairman said, I think, uh, last week, you know, we, we outmatch China today. Our, there's no question that our force and that our army is superior to the People's Liberation Army, even with the modernization that they've undertaken. But it's our next generation capabilities that are most important and are, that are, will make the difference in us staying ahead of China. And that's why in this budget we have worked so hard to prioritize the 31 plus 4 programs to make sure that they are sufficiently funded. That has meant that we have made some reductions to some of our older um, munitions, for example, and we have reduced some of the funding for some of our enduring programs, but we are protecting investments in the new capabilities. But the budget requests... Um, also roughly $4 billion in cuts for the research and development acquisition and procurement budgets. So isn't that a future budget that we're also cutting? What we've tried to do there, again, is 74% of our RDT&E is focused on our next generation programs. We, we have, again, to make sure we could protect the most important crown jewel modernization programs, we did reduce RDT&E in some other areas. But research and development is for the future, correct? Yes, but yes, but we have the most important future programs we have fully protected. Okay, my, I'm going to switch gears. For my final question, I'd like to ask you both, Madam Secretary and General, um, to comment on what is next for the Abrams tank. As China continues to build up its forces, the U.S. Army's continued procurement of the modern Abrams tank is essential to our readiness, as well as the U.S. industrial base. 
can you both please give me a sense of what is next for the generation of Abrams tank? What, what it's gonna look like or what um, requirements and technologies do you have in mind for that specific tank? Certainly, Congresswoman, and I'll let the chief also add. I would say, you know, we are, first of all, we are continuing to buy the Abrams tank. That is a system we will continue to need. Uh, and we are making sure that we have funding for it in our budget. We are also, however, looking at a new armored multi-purpose vehicle. That is one of our six modernization focus areas. Uh, so we will be, again, sort of keeping our, our existing capability to make sure that we have a bridge until we get to um, the future armored capabilities. And I'll let General McConville add. Is there funding in your request for the new generation of Abrams? Be yeah, can I? Please. I mean, first of all, when it, com when it comes to the Abrams right now, I see that as people talk about legacy and modernization. I, I, right. I have another character. I call it enduring. The, 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 the Abrams main battle tank is not going anywhere. We are continuing to incrementally improve that. We got the M1A2 SEF version 3. We're fielding that right now. There's a modernization program, and, and you'll see uh, based on the resources available, uh, we went to three quarters. We were fielding a brigade a year. We're going to three quarters of a brigade a year, and, and, and you know that is in my uh, unfunded requirement that lays it out. And we, we have to some of the programs that we call enduring. That that's like the Apache helicopter. That's the Black Hawk. That's the Abrams. You'll see that that that, that fielding slowing down because we're trying to give you the best time we can within the resources that we have. Thank you, sir. Gentleman's time has expired. Ms. Strickland is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Smith and Ranking Member Rogers, and thank you to Secretary Warmoth and General McConville. I have the privilege of representing Joint Base Lewis McCord and the more than 40,000 service members who call it home. Joint Base Lewis McCord, or JBLM, is the, only, is the Army's only war protection platform that is west of the Rockies in the continental U.S and has an important role as the department continues to focus on the Indo-Pacific. I also recognize that Joint Base Lewis and McCord is one of the fastest growing regions in the entire United States, and that creates challenges with housing, training, and encroachment concerns. I'm committed to working with JBLM and all parties to address these issues and maintain JBLM's readiness. Secretary Warmoth, I want to discuss several issues that are very important to my district. One of my priorities in entering office is to facilitate a productive and positive relationship between JBLM and the Nisqually tribe of Indians. As the Nisqually has tried to meet its community's growth needs, it's been constrained by JBLM on three sides. The Nisqually are seeking to transfer 112 acres of unused land from JBLM to the Nisqually. While negotiations over this transfer have been progressing for the past year and a half, it is my expectation that all parties will ensure that these negotiations maintain prioritization and that negotiations are finalized in a manner that is equitable and timely. So, Secretary, will you please commit to working with me to help resolve this issue in a way that provides equitable benefits to all parties by fiscal year 23? My staff and I stand at the ready. Thank you, Congresswoman. I certainly... Um commit to you to, to work on this issue with you. I am actually going to be going out to see uh, JBLM in August, I believe, and uh, would be happy to frankly learn more about the, the situation there and uh, would be, again, happy to work with you and make, make sure that we are uh, being inclusive in terms of the negotiations that are ongoing. Well, thank you. We look forward to your visit and thank you for that commitment. I want to talk a bit now about the JBLM's role in ensuring a free and open Indo-Pacific. It's strategically vital, and we know it's important to maintaining a free and open Indo-Pacific. The Army plans to have three multi-domain task forces, MDTFs, one in Europe and two in the Indo-Pacific. Joint Base Lewis McCord was proud to host the pilot program. As you consider requirements in the Indo-Pacific, will you commit to keeping one of the task forces at JBLM? Congresswoman, uh, we, we are also very proud of the first multi-domain task force and are very pleased that it is um, already being, you know, part of our ability to experiment with new, with new concepts and new operational approaches. Uh, certainly, it's going to be very important to be able to have a, a West Coast um, orientation for our MDTFs. 
I think you know we'll uh, want to look overall at our strategy, particularly as this administration is developing a, a revised national defense strategy. Um, so we'll want to look at the entirety of, of our global posture and where we put our new capabilities, but we're very pleased with the work that MDTF is doing already, and I think it's, it's in a good place right now. Great. And then one quick issue that one of my colleagues raised already, the issue of housing. As one of the fastest growing markets in the country, I hear from service members coming here and their spouses that housing is hard to find. And it's expensive here because the supply is constrained. In many cases, you know, we have a base allowance for housing that just doesn't keep up with the cost of housing in our market. And spouses are often required to work so that they can meet their basic needs and even put food on the table. So will you please work with me to find creative solutions to addressing the housing affordability and supply crisis affecting our service members? For example, there are over 700 households on the waiting list right now to get housing on post at JBLM, but we know that 70% of those who serve live off base. Yes, Congresswoman, I'll certainly uh, work with you to try to address these kinds of challenges. Uh, you know, we see costs, frankly, also rising in, in Austin, Texas, where we have Army Futures Command, and we know that's a challenge, particularly for some of our younger soldiers and families. So we will uh, do our best to work with you in this area. All right, thank you very much for answering those questions. I yield back my time, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Franklin is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ranking Member Rogers, and, and I appreciate our witnesses being here today. I know you all are very busy, so thank you for carving time out of your days for us. Um, Mrs. McLean mentioned before, and I want to touch on some more general, um, the matter of munitions, specifically precision uh, guided munitions. In the testimony, uh, it was discussed that there are a limited number of suppliers to, for key components of those precision guided munitions. Those are critical assets, they're in high demand. Um, what are we doing to uh, ensure that we're going to keep these suppliers alive when it looks like our munitions budget is being cut by about 25 percent? Is that a concern for you, and what are we addressing? How are we addressing that going forward? No, it's, I, th I think it is a concern. I mean, I think we've learned a lot about uh, supply chain, and as you said, some of these precision munitions uh, take a, a long, they have some long lead type items that you have to purchase, and, and that's part of our, our equation. We take a look at it. So we may be buying long lead, not necessarily, you know, we always have to be a little more finesse in these type systems. We, if we can't afford the entire munition, we may buy the long range up front, the, 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 the long uh, lead type items, and go ahead and do that. But we're, take, we're taking a, a close look at that and, um, and trying to do the best we can within the budget we have. Well, I know for a lot of these suppliers, predictability and consistency from one year to the next, you know, we budget in this 12-month cycle, but they need to look out long-term so that, you know, they need to know that we're going to be there consistently uh, buying for them to keep their, uh, their, their processes in place. I want to touch a little bit more on um, uh, this issue we've talked a little bit uh, regarding discrimination. A couple of members have brought it up in his opening remarks, uh, Chairman Smith had addressed the issue of discrimination in the ranks and, and the services issues to eradicate it. I think we can all agree that that's, uh, it's very important. Uh, Secretary Wormuth, you, you spoke about the importance of building cohesive teams. General, you did as well, and talking about the need for dignity and respect. Um, you know, in my experience, whether it's sports teams, military units, businesses, uh, really the foundation of that cohesiveness, uh, I think, is fundamentally comes down to trust. And that trust is really built on a matter of character and competence. And certainly if there's discrimination in the ranks, that's going to erode at that character element. Uh, I've, had a, I've been surprised. I've had a number of constituents who are on active duty, a lot of veterans, but I'm, I'm placing more stock currently in the active duty folks, reach out to me. Uh, which is kind of surprising. Uh, I'd never in my 26 years in the Navy would have ever dreamed of going outside the chain of command to reach out to someone in Congress, but there's a lot of concern. Uh, one in particular, I, I, I thought so much about it, I called this, this gentleman up, spoke to him at length. He is a, an Army uh, senior non-commissioned officer. Uh, his concern is that we are sowing, potentially sowing distrust among the troops and that we're, we're kind of telling these people in a military that has civilian oversight that um, your leaders basically can't be trusted. Uh, whether they know it or not, inherently, they've got bias in everything they do, they do and every decision they make is viewed through a lens of race that they can't help. Um, I don't know that I necessarily agree with that. But, um, General, what, what, um, 
Well, and, and he went on to say that I'm teaching these guys, these folks, um, and he's in a leadership position or, or training capacity. Uh, these are folks that are going to have to give orders in combat. They're going to have to give them and receive them. And his concern is, are we creating a, a climate of mistrust where when someone makes a decision that's in a life or death moment, and it may involve the death of soldiers, is someone going to stop to think, now is that decision, is that order being given through a lens of race? Um, what, what measures have you taken to help ensure that your commander's intent isn't being distorted by the time it reaches the deck plate levels? I think um, what's really important is our approach to all these, you know, what some people would call harmful behaviors. How do you get after um, sexual harassment, sexual assault? How do you get after, you know, extremism, ra um, racism, if there is in your organizations? And I argue that's why it starts with building cohesive teams, where you treat everyone with dignity and respect, and you, 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 you bring them together. We've done a lot of, you know, it's, it's interesting. We had a, I know we don't have a long answer, but, you know, you go to, someone that does this for a living that wrote the tribe and how you how you bring build cohesive teams for civilians well you get a small group together you take them along hike you, you have them stay out um, overnight and that that's really good for building cohesive teams that's exactly what we do in the army is we've got to build cohesive teams we've got to trust commanders we've got to make sure as we change anything that you know commanders are the ones that are going to make this happen leaders are the ones that are going to make things happen happen in the army we should never forget that All right. thank you general i'll, I'll yield back Thank you, Mr. Kahele is recognized for five minutes. Mahalo, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Rogers, and aloha, Madam Secretary, and General McConville. In your joint written testimony, you stated uh, strategic readiness involves installation capabilities to mobilize, train, and deploy formations, and then sustain them from the homeland. I would like to ask a question regarding the Hawaii Infrastructure Readiness Initiative, which the Army has committed to a 10-year, $1 billion program to invest in the Army infrastructure in Hawaii. This will be roughly $100 million per year. It's mostly MILCON. Uh, the funds are essential in repairing, renovating, and constructing facilities that USERPAC has identified as critical to meeting the DOD strategic plans for the Indo-Pacific region. By the Army's own admission in 2019, approximately 45% of all Army infrastructure in Hawaii is failing, putting efforts to meet operational needs at risk. The total cost to repair that infrastructure is $1.1 billion, and the cost to address the deficit of that infrastructure is $3 billion. HIRE addresses several major facility and infrastructure deficiencies, including aviation maintenance facilities, operations facilities, tactical equipment maintenance facilities, the Pohakaloa training area, and a vital MILCON project, the Westlock Ammunition Storage Facility. Recently, competing demands within the Army have caused a delay of HIRE projects. Additionally, there is a perceived cap of $100 million for HIRE projects within the Army that are causing several projects to be broken up into several smaller projects to meet this arbitrary cap. And as a result, many projects are now more expensive than if executed as a single project. So my question, Madam Secretary, is how can we accelerate the timeline of HIRE and help the Army save money by allowing projects to be executed as a whole instead of a piecemeal development strategy? Thank you, Congressman, for that question. Uh, you know, first of all, our, our footprint in Hawaii is very, very important, particularly as we look to the Indo-Pacific theater. And we remain committed to the, to the Hawaii uh, Infrastructure you know, Readiness Initiative. Uh, we are, as you know, um, making a, you know, we're, we're balancing our people, taking care of our people, we're balancing readiness, we're balancing modernization, so we are having to make some hard choices. I think what I would like to do is um, look into the issues that you raised in more detail, particularly the issue of um, potentially the fact that we're breaking up larger projects into smaller projects to see what we might be able to do uh, to accelerate things. But, but again, part of this is we are balancing and we have an overall facilities improvement plan that we use to, to guide what we're doing. But we are committed to the infrastructure in Hawaii, so I'll look into that and get back to you. Okay, thank you. Sticking with the Indo-Pacific, and, and I'll, um, um, you know, my colleague from Ohio raised this earlier, and, and I am also concerned that, you know, just in the last hour and 20 minutes of this hearing, we've talked about China multiple times. We always talk about China in this, co in this committee, and I'm concerned that some of the talking points that come out of the Pentagon are not reflected in the sense of urgency to respond to China. And in reviewing the Army's budget and its FY22 budget requests, I'm concerned we're not dedicating enough funding to the Pacific and Indo-PACOM. In the Army's Pacific Deterrence Initiative, 
request of about 1.8 billion. That's 1.5 billion less than the Army's request for EDI, which is 3.43 billion. As we pivot to the Pacific and China and their rapidly advancing military, Sir General, does this budget meet, in your opinion, the future needs of the Army to fight, to win in the Pacific, to deter China from taking any more territory in the region, to support and keep our forces in the first island chain, to add more troop rotations, more exercises that can pre prepare us uh, for China and, and for um, potential conflicts in the Western Pacific? Well, I think, I think that what, what's in the budget, it, it does, Congressman, as far as setting it, but there's some long-term, um, there's a strategic posture review that's going on right now that's going to inform uh, what type of investments uh, should be made. We certainly have contingencies for that. We're taking a look at that. And uh, just going back to the, you know, uh, the 25th in, in uh, Schofield Barracks, where I had a chance to serve, those barracks are something we really want to get after. Really concerned about the soldiers living there. They do an incredible job, and uh, we, we want to get after them as soon as we get the resources to make that happen. All right, thank you. Uh, 30 seconds, Madam Secretary. Anything in regards to the, the Pentagon's budget and PDI? Uh, Again, I know that we're, we're, we're looking again department-wide at PDI to make sure that we're reflecting congressional intent. Uh, but I think, you know, we have 69,000 troops aligned with the Indo-PACOM with USERPAC, and, and the focus of our modernization is really to get after the China threat. Okay. Mahalo. Mahalo, Mr. Chairman. I yield the remainder of my time. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Bice is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Madam Secretary and General McConville, thank you for being with us today. And General, thank you for your service and the service of your children. My home state of Oklahoma is proud of the tens of thousands of soldiers who are stationed at Fort Sill. The Fort Sill and Lawton, Oklahoma communities work hand in hand to support the mission of the United States Army and to support the military personnel and families stationed there. My first question focuses on the Paladin Integrated Management Program, which is assembled in Elgin, Oklahoma. The Army identified an unfunded requirement of $149.5 million for the Paladin Program. When coupled with the Army's FY22 budget request, this would procure up to 36 sets of the equipment. However, that's still only half of the full rate of production, volume specified in the DOD-approved acquisition program baseline of 60 sets per year. I'm concerned that this lower volume will cause significant growth in the cost of each unit and could lead to adverse impacts on the highly skilled workforce in my state. General, uh, what, is, what analysis did the Army use to determine the unfunded requirement for that $149.5 million? Uh, what, what the analysis that uh, we used, uh, Congressman, we, we can come back and give you some detailed analysis, but it's basically looking about the resources available. It's, it's looking at uh, what the manufacturer can actually uh, complete within the time and then within the prioritization, uh, taking a look at what resources are available and uh, making those type calls. I believe the um, 36 sets is actually less than that um, required, that allotment of, of able production in that time frame. Um, what do you believe the impact on fielding to soldiers in the industrial base by moving away from the current volumes of the 44 to 48 sets per year? Well, they're not going to modernize as fast as uh, we would like them to. Madam Secretary. Any I would agree with what the chief said. I mean, you know, we, as, as I am learning in real time, we have a very detailed process um, that goes underneath how we build the budgets. And we look at we look at equipping, we look at sustaining, we look at training, and we look in tremendous depth. But you know, given available resources, we are not always able to fund all of those priorities in all of those program elements to the 100% level. But we do try to be very, very thoughtful and careful about where we accept, accept risk, for example. Do you believe that this is a critical uh, component for Army readiness? Certainly, the, the Paladin program is an enduring program for us. Uh, again, we, you know, as you have pointed out, we have reduced the funding somewhat to be able to balance other requirements, but it continues to be an important capability for us. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> my second question touches on the extended range, <coughs> excuse me, cannon artillery program, which is also assembled at Elgin. <clears throat> the Army uh, program manager <clears throat> in charge of the range, excuse me for just a second, recently identified a two-part acquisition strategy for the program, <clears throat> which includes a competition to build and assemble kits for IRCA and a separate competition to integrate those kits into the Paladin. Can you verify that this IRCA acquisition 
that this is the ARC of, um, <clears throat> acquisition strategy. Do you have any perspective on that? The Congresswoman, um, you know, while the, the IRCA program is an important part of our long-range precision fires, it's not a program I've had the opportunity yet to dive into deeply, so I'll yield to my chief to take that one. Yeah, I, I, we'll come back to you on the programmatics. I mean, I know what we're doing with the extended range can is something we want to do. We're very um, pleased with the results so far, the ranges we're getting. You know, as we talk about uh, deterrence and great power competition, the ability to have speed and range. You know, there were other people that came before committees like this and said we were outranged or outgunned. Uh, we don't see that in the future, and that's what we're trying to make sure we can produce. Um, do you think that we'll be able to meet the goal uh, to field a battalion in 23 and another in 24 based on the requirements? And you may not be able to answer that given. Um, that's our intent. OK. All right. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you. Ms. Jacobs is recognized for five minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you, Secretary Wormuth and General McConville for, for being here with us. Um, I want to start with you, uh, Secretary Wormuth. Uh, the optionally manned fighting vehicle is the first of several vehicle modernization programs the Army is developing. Um, what lessons were learned from last year's cancellation of the initial solicitation, specifically with the requirements process, and how can we do better with requirements early in these programs? Thank you, Congresswoman. I think the uh, the optionally manned fighting vehicle is a good example of how, you know, as I've come into this role, how the Army is approaching modernization and its acquisition efforts differently than we have in the past. You know, so unlike the future combat system, for example, where we, um, you know, loaded up a lot of requirements very early in the process and were perhaps somewhat unrealistic about what was technologically possible, with um, ONFV, we're trying to do it in a much more incremental, iterative way. So first, you know, we went out and we, we did market research to understand you know, what might be possible, what kinds of uh, producers might be out there. We then engaged in conversation with industry about what, what kinds of characteristics we're looking for in the optionally manned fighting vehicle. We then you know, moved incrementally to looking at potentially what designs will be out there and and we're going to again continue to pursue this iterative approach where which first of all gives more opportunity for more companies uh, in the private sector to compete but also will give us a better sense of what's actually possible uh, and achievable before we down select so I, I think actually we've we've learned a lot and feel good about the path that we're on right now with ONFV Thank you. Um, General McConville, anything to add before I move on to the, the next topic? No, I think when you know, we talk about transformation, we are transforming the way we actually buy weapon systems. And, and what we're finding is by going to characteristics, vice requirements early on in the process, we encourage innovation. We get other people to participate in, in the process. And, and as we move forward, we actually get to drive before we buy or fly before we buy, which we think is a, a, a much uh, better approach. Thank you. Um, I'd now like to discuss the long range precision fires. I know we've talked about it uh, a few times already and and it was in your written testimony, um, but I wanted to drill down a, a bit further. Uh, how do you see these non strategic hypersonic weapons playing a role in the battlefield of the future? Specifically, their long range nature will completely change the way the army needs to collect targeting information. And has the army adequately thought about the way sensors will need to be connected to shooters in order to make these weapons effective? Congresswoman, uh, a couple comments on that. Um, you know, first of all, I think long-range precision fires are really essential uh, for the Army, but frankly, for the entire Joint Force, in terms of helping us address the anti-access area denial challenges that both China and Russia present to us. And I think it's important to not forget about the European theater and about the challenges you know, we face from Russia. There's, there is a lot of appropriate emphasis on China, but we need to remember the European theater as well. And, uh, and the, the programs that we're pursuing here, whether it's long-range hypersonic weapon or uh, PRISM or uh, the extended range cannon, those are all, you know, weapon systems that will allow us to hit targets from, you know, much longer standoff distances. And in terms to your very important point about connecting sensors to shooters, we're really trying to use our Project Convergence initiative, which is sort of our, our campaign of learning, to try to help us understand 
how we can use these capabilities, how we can work with the other services to connect, uh, to connect, to use our sensors to connect to the best shooters for a particular target. And we, we have a joint board of directors for our Project Convergence Initiative uh, that allows us to bring in all of the services to our efforts so that we can explore those issues. And the chief may want to add something. Yeah, I think the secretary laid up the only thing I had, you know, long range precision fires re require long range targeting and precision targeting. And we're certainly developing uh, the capabilities to do that within the joint force. Uh, and, and, and that's what we're having the discussion about who is actually going to do that targeting uh, and, and what's the best way to do that. Well, thank you. And in, in my final 20 seconds, I'll just echo my colleagues' um, encouragement to make sure we're addressing housing and, and continuing to execute the Army Housing Campaign Plan. Um, and I, too, was on the Code Alta Fort Hood and, and encourage you to continue working on, on sexual assault. And Mr. Chair, I yield back. Thank you. Mr. Green is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member. Uh, Thanks to our witnesses for being here. Uh, I've known General McConville for many, many years, and to my members, uh, fellow members, his service is venerable. Uh, thank you, sir. And Madam Secretary, it's great to great to meet you. Um, as I flip through the budget, I know I'm digging into the weeds here, uh, General McConville, but the seems like the Army is uh, getting tasks fairly significantly. In fact, it looked like more than any other service branch for the Indo-PACOM, and I just wondered if you wouldn't elaborate on that a little bit and uh, kind of tell us what kind of missions they're, they're getting tasked to do out there. Yeah, I think, um, you know, it's interesting. A lot of people want to look at the Indo-Pacific, and they see a lot of blue water out there, and they say it's a maritime theater, and it's an air theater. And I, I would say certainly that's very, very important. Uh, but we have key allies and partners out there. I can run the whole, the whole list, but I, I've spent a lot of time with the chiefs of staffs out there. And so the question becomes, what, what does a combatant commander want from the Army? What do our allies and partners want? Uh, they certainly want a multi-domain task force capability, uh, which has the ability to provide long-range precision effects and long-range precision fires for deterrence. Our security force assistance brigades right now are being used in, in many countries out there because they're building partner uh, capabilities and capacity. Special forces is in high demand out there with, for the same uh, type reasons. We're doing multiple exercises with our allies and partners, not only in the theater, they've actually come to our Joint Readiness Training Center because they want to get that type of training. We think that's uh, extremely important. When it comes to logistics, the Army does logistics. If you've got a vaccination, you know a little about Army logistics. Uh, and so uh, the, the Army has a critical role out there, and we just need to be postured to provide that. Well, good. Thanks for elaborating on that. Uh, you know, my office is getting, uh, Madam Secretary, I would say pictures texted to us about once a, once a month at a minimum about the barracks at uh, First Brigade. And um, I, I keep pushing this issue. As I have been told, I can't do a, an appropriation on it unless you guys, MILCON, puts it on its list. And I understand there's a 21% increase in the budget for MILCON, but I would like to ask you to take a look at what those barracks look like and, and ask yourself, 1st Brigade, the 101st Airborne Division, if you'd want your son or daughter in there. My son happens to be. And uh, it's uh, it, it, mold and issues like that need to be addressed in, that, in those buildings. Um, General McConville, on the issue of aviation, I noticed a uh, combat aviation request of $2.8 billion, a $1.3 billion uh, decrease from 2021, and as we talk about the Army's use in Indo-PACOM and the commander wanting to see you guys out there more, it, wouldn't there need to be an increase in aviation budget as opposed to a decrease? And uh, if so, is there some risk we're taking? And, and, you know, can you talk about that risk? Well, we're certainly concerned about making sure that, um, you know, the, 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 uh, our pilots get the flying hours that they need to do. I mean, it, it, and what you find is if we don't invest in flying hours, whether it's flight school or flying hours uh, in the units, we see a lack of proficiency and that tends to come back in uh, accidents. So we are concerned about that. We're trying to make sure that we get the right amount of money uh, that, that's needed. And I, I would you know, say that the, the money that we have in readiness right now needs to stay there. We have um, done some uh, very stringent, you know, I want to say, you know, uh, uses of readiness. There's not, there's not room to, you know, when we put in you for some, you can't cut it anymore is I what can't cut it anymore yeah I don't you know you yeah, need to keep that readiness because it's 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 been very efficiently managed I guess is the way I, I want to say it that that's a very um, 
a good way to say it, I guess, and I, I echo what uh, the ranking member said earlier, we're concerned that the budget that the, the administration has handed you or asked you to live under is probably less than what you need. But one, one thing in the final minute that I have, I mentioned this with General Milley um, just a few weeks ago, and that's the CTC rotations. And I went back and did my homework, and, and I was right. Uh, they were set for 26 in 2021, and it looks like 17 in 2022. That's a big concern as we think about China and Russia, these pacing threats, large-scale ground operations. Um, can you elaborate a little bit on that cut? And is 17 enough? Well, Congress, I, I, I probably need to brief you offline because I just have, you know, I have the numbers in front of me. It's a, it's a little different. Uh, we've sure. got 20. Uh, I, I think the, you know, what's interesting is if you take the 22, we've got 20 rotations scheduled, uh, eight in uh, NTC, eight in JRTC. Now, two of those, we're doing something different now. We're going to actually do the rotations, probably one in Alaska and one in Hawaii, which is a little, so if you're talking to the folks at the CTCs, they're going to go, hey, wait a minute, we used to have this many. Okay, and the other thing we're doing, the it, gentleman's issues. time has expired. AMRC, I can come okay, back. Yep. Ms. Loria is recognized for five minutes. Well, uh, thank you. And, and General McConville, I want to go back to something that General Milley uh, said during his testimony last week. He said, decisive outcomes in war are ultimately achieved on land. Do you agree with this statement? Absolutely. So in your opening statement, you write, the Army remains prepared to fight and win the nation's wars. Can you briefly describe what it would mean from the Army's perspective to win in a war with China, or as General Milley put it, to achieve a decisive outcome? Yeah, I would say winning with China is not fighting China. I think uh, the way I would describe it is they have the ability uh, that we have overmatch. Um, and again, I, I, I kind of believe in a philosophy of peace through strength. And that strength comes from a whole of government effort where you have a very strong military, you have a very strong army, so people you know, do not want to take the risks of doing certain things. And you also have strong allies and partners who share the same vision of the world order and they are going to stand side by side and not allow some of these things to happen. So then focusing on the Army's component on that, a ground component such as the Army, um, what would the Army provide towards this decisive outcome, which I think we would all agree we would like to not fight um, ultimately that war? Well, it's going to provide uh, the capabilities. You know, it's going to provide long-range precision fires. It's going to provide uh, maneuver uh, vehicles that can, um, the, the only way to compel people uh, is, is on the ground to stop those type things from happening. And uh, what we want to have is a very lethal and agile army. And we think we get that through um, having speed, range, and convergence that gives mm -hmm. us decision dominance and, and having the, the appropriate uh, amount of capability within the joint force to uh, okay. be able to um, deter them from taking on those type of actions. Okay, so as you know, and you, you referred to earlier, that many strategists have you know, said that the conflict in the Western Pacific is primarily a naval and an air campaign. And it seems that based on this discussion, you see a role for ground forces and a role for the Army in a conflict in the Western Pacific. Uh, recently, the head of Air Force Global Strike Command said that your effort, the Army's effort to base long range missiles in the Pacific was expensive, duplicative, and stupid. Um, and the number one priority for PACOM and the Pacific Deterrent Initiative is missile defense. Yet, that is your number six modernization priority behind, behind long-range precision fires, next-generation combat vehicle, vertical lift, and others in your budget submission. Can you briefly explain why the Army is pursuing long-range fires in the Pacific, including shore-based anti-ship missiles, when one, there are no basing agreements to house these weapons in the first island chain. Two, the Marine Corps is developing the same, but a more mobile capability. And three, the cost of delivering this capability far exceeds the Navy and Air Force capabilities. Yeah, I, I think, um, Congressman, that we absolutely need long-range precision fires. I think it provides um, multiple options for the combatant commander. If you take a look at what the Secretary was talking about, and you have to take a look at anti-access area denial, and I would recommend get a classified brief on what those capabilities they have because our adversaries have sophisticated integrated air and missile defense. They have, they have sophisticated- right, I'm not trying to argue against no, long uh, range fires, but just the role of the Army in that when the Navy and the Air Force are well, already, the Marine Corps and Air Force are already developing those capabilities at potentially a 
a lower cost. And just pivoting on that as well, um, so the Army has a good and soon to be improved um, ground-based missile defense capability if the low-tier air and missile defense system, system works. Um, but the Navy operates Aegis Ashore missile defense system. Why doesn't the Army um, take over the Aegis Ashore, uh, which is what the PACOM commander asked for in Guam, instead of building a new multi-billion dollar radar? Well, we're going to take a look at what is the best way to do integrated air and missile defense. We've got a um, IFPIC capability, an Iron Dome capability. Uh, where the Army is going right now is on an integrated air missile defense battle command system that will they'll take advantage of conversions using multiple sensors to uh, multiple different shooters, and, and, and that's um, where we're going as far as that process. The Aegis right now, we do not have people. It's not a matter of just taking over. We'd have to train a, a whole cohort. Of well, people. I understand that, but my whole yeah. point is this, that there's duplicity. Like we're duplicating things amongst the services when um, at the same time you and the other service chiefs will talk a lot about jointness. It seems like there's you know excess uh, redundancy um, and funds in this budget that go to things that are you know significantly overlapping amongst the services. And I'm sorry, but my time is expired. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, before we move on to the next person, a few programming notes. We're going to stop at 2 o'clock, um, and there are votes between here and there. Again, as I did last time, I'm going to try to keep going and have members coming so we can maximize the time, make sure someone is here to ask a question. Uh, so just be prepared for that. Uh, Mr. Johnson, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Secretary Warmoth, and uh, General McConville. Thank you both for being here today. And thank you, General, for your commitment to maintaining peace through strength. I appreciate how you articulated that a few moments ago. Uh, last week, I asked Secretary Austin and General Milley, who are here, about Army readiness. And General Milley uh, had what I thought was a memorable quote. He said, wars are often started from afar, from long-range weapons systems. They're always ended, however, somewhere on the ground. And the last bullet of a war is usually fired by a Marine or Army infantryman. So it's critical to maintain the readiness of the United States Army. Um, our training centers, both at, at Fort Irwin and Fort Polk, as well as in Germany, are going to be critically important moving forward to maintain our current ground force capabilities. I represent Fort Polk. It's in my district, proudly. Um, how would you say the President's budget request for the Army accounts for those considerations, namely Army readiness and, and getting rotations through our training centers? I know you were addressing that briefly with Congressman Green a few moments ago. I, maybe I go to the Secretary first. Sure, Congressman. Uh, you know, first of all, readiness is incredibly important. It's one of our, you know, I, I think of, uh, I sort of think of the overall Army program as a three-legged stool. You have modernization, you have readiness, and you have, uh, you know, force structure. So we have, as, as the Chief said, we have uh, funded 20 rotations, CTC rotations, uh, in that, in our budget, uh, because the Army has worked very hard in the last several years to dig itself out of a readiness trough that was, you know, substantially a result of sequestration and the Budget Control Act. Uh, and maintaining that readiness to be able to fight tonight is, is very important. So we've tried to emphasize that and don't feel that there's uh, really any headspace in that area, if you will. I don't know, General McConville, if you want to add to that. I think, it, you know, our combat training centers are, are really the gold standard of how we train battalion and brigade units, and so they're absolutely uh, critical for what we're trying to do. What we're, with, the, with the budget, and again, as we take a look at how much, you know, we're trying to most efficiently use the resources we have. So if you take a look at the 20 uh, rotations, accordingly, we're doing eight out at the combat training center at NTC. That's kind of armor, you know, large-scale type ground copper, uh, uh, combat operations, and most of the units are fairly close to that, and so they're able to do that. For the Joint Readiness Training Center, we're doing a couple of things. One is we're going to move them actually maybe to Alaska, the, the, the cadre, to run a, a CTC-like rotation in Alaska under the conditions because, you know, if you're going to be an Arctic warrior, it might be better to be trained in that environment. And the same thing out in the jungle. So we're taking a look at that. And the same thing for units going to Europe. The cut down the op tempo, we have a CTC there. So what we'd like to do is run them through a combat training center as part of the deployment rather than having them get to a deployment and, and taking a look at the op tempo. So that we're trying to balance everything within, you know, resources, and one of the resources is time. So how do we best use their time? And if we have to bring uh, a, a unit's equipment all the way from Hawaii, put it on a boat, and by the time it gets to Fort Polk, and then put it on a boat and send it back, 
uh, that they were away from their equipment for a couple of months. So we're trying to figure out the best way to do this within the resources that we have. Just a parenthetical note that Fort Polk can mimic the conditions of anywhere except the Arctic. So I, 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 no, I know, that's right. You, uh, I've, the, spent, I've spent some good quality time. <laughs> yes, sir, I'm sure you have. Uh, the, the new Global Defender exercise is funded in the budget request and described by the Army as additive and designed to showcase Army re, uh, modernization priorities and, quote, key Department of Defense and congressional audiences, unquote. Um, yet, the large-scale theater-level Defender Europe exercise that was previously scheduled for FY2022 is not funded in the budget request. Um, first of all, what are the goals of the, of the global uh, Defender exercise, and, and, and what does the Army mean by that in terms of the audiences who it's focused for? I let, given how new I am, why don't I let the Chief talk about that one? Yeah, well, you know, Defenders have been really running across three kind of uh, scenarios. One is certainly defend to Europe, which was, you know, large amount of forces going that was impacted um, by COVID, but we still were able to accomplish a lot of goals. And those will continue, but the, 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 the focal point was that. The same thing with uh, 21 Indo-Pacific, you know, that, that was a, a major exercise. The intent of this exercise is just to take a look at, as we look at the future, um, what's the global uh, impact of being contested all the way from home to one of the theaters we're gonna to have to go to. So, you know, we see uh, the change in the environment. We're seeing little effects of that, you know, from cyber and some other things that, you know, people can um, basically impact the United States uh, in ways that we've never seen before. And so we need to be aware of that. We need to be able to mobilize our forces. We need to be able to get them uh, through the various centers and, and we need to make sure the infrastructure is gonna support us deploying in a contested environment. Thank you both. I'm out of time. I yield back. Uh, Ms. Escobar is recognized for five minutes. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman and Secretary Warmoth and General McConville. Thank you so much for being here today. Really appreciate your service to our country and your time before our committee this morning. And Madam Secretary, I look forward to at some point welcoming you to El Paso and to Fort Bliss. And General McConville, look forward to, to our visit coming up soon. I have the honor and privilege of representing El Paso, Texas, home to Fort Bliss, America's second largest military installation, largest joint mobilization force generation installation in the Army, and the first armored division, America's only armored tank division. And I've had the privilege of spending some time visiting with soldiers, not just on base and off base, not just in my district, but outside of my district. And with regard to women in particular, I can tell you I, I really appreciate your um, leaning into addressing sexual harassment and sexual assault because on many fronts we really truly have failed women um, and we have to do better. The same thing goes for suicides. And we've, we had a conversation yesterday about the most recent suicide at Fort Bliss um, and the, the tragedy surrounding that suicide. But also this is the second death um, in just uh, several months. Two young women soldiers and it is, I know that this is a, a terrible and difficult issue to address. But what is it, in looking back, I appreciate that, that we now understand very clearly where the chronic issue is and who needs to be um, provided resources and reinforcement, so to speak. But what, in your view, is happening? What is going on here where we have not done well enough? And, and what are the first steps to doing better? Congresswoman, um a couple of things. On, on suicide, we're certainly very concerned about that, and we have a historically high rate of suicide in the Army right now, which is very concerning. You know, often uh, suicides, you know, come about with behavioral health issues, um, often relationship problems, sometimes financial issues. But I think what we're trying to do through the This Is My Squad initiative, through working on improving our command climate down to the lowest level, uh, working on, you know, trying to introduce evidence-based suicide prevention programs. We're trying, some of the things we're doing, I think, will help us get after a range of harmful behaviors, whether it's sexual harassment or whether it's trying to prevent suicide. A lot of it is trying to um, make sure, as, as General McConville said, that we've got that golden triangle of do our soldiers 
feel uh, connected to their families, connected to their squad mates, and connected to their leaders. And um, you know, if they have those connections, we have a better opportunity to get ahead of any potential problems. But, but this is something I think we're just going to have to continue working on, uh, and it's going to take, I think, consistent year after year focus and effort. And I appreciate that. One thing that I'd add, but obviously we're not the first institution to deal with this and with this particular age group, as, as had mentioned, um, and with the vulnerability of this population. Are, are we looking essentially outside the box and outside of the DOD for best practices and for um, advice and support? I, I, you know, I, I appreciate the DOD's response, the Army's response, et cetera, but there are institutions outside of the U.S. military who have had to grapple with this as well, and are we looking, leaning on them at all? Yes, I think we, we are, as I said, you know, trying to really look outside the department for evidence-based suicide prevention programs and to learn from other institutions. Um, you know, that we have, a, we have a pilot program running at a couple of major installations that's focused on the suicide challenge in particular, but we absolutely should be looking to every possible source of good ideas uh, outside of the Army and the Department of Defense. And in my last 30 seconds, the last thing I'll add, we've had this conversation about uh, infrastructure on Fort Bliss, the barracks, the railhead, and I really look forward to exploring with you and, and would seek your commitment to, to really taking a long, hard look at the, the cost-benefit analysis there, especially for the railhead, the lack of investment in that and what it's costing us in the long term, the longer we wait, but also the barracks. And clearly, it's a chronic issue. I've heard it from other colleagues as well on this committee, but really would love for you to see those barracks on Fort Bliss. They are in desperate need of investment. Thank, Thank you, you Mr. Chairman. Time I yield back. has expired. Uh, Mr. Waltz is recognized for five minutes. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good to see you, Chief, Madam Secretary. Uh, General McConville, in your Senate testimony, you described 2020 as the year of the National Guard. Uh, and, and I couldn't agree more uh, between COVID response, national unrest, vaccine deployment, uh, record hurricane season, record firefighting season, and, and plus the overseas missions that they have to be uh, ready to deploy. The problem is these domestic missions are disproportionately affecting our, our various states where the Guard's force structure is, is aligned. Um, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to submit for the record a letter uh, signed by 55 of my colleagues from Texas, Florida, and California uh, addressing this issue. Um, if I could ask consent. Uh, Hearing no objection, so ordered. Thank you. It's addressed this issue that these states per capita have the smallest National Guard force structures. They actually rank 52, 53, and 54, uh, I think somewhat surprisingly. And you overlay with that, they're most prone to natural disasters, certainly in California, uh, Texas, and, and Florida in particular. So I want to be clear, I'm not asking or suggesting that states should lose force structure. What I am asking your support to work with us on is that as some of these states voluntarily shed because they can't recruit or for other reasons, that we take those population factors into account. This domestic mission is critical, and I would, you, I, I would think you would agree that the strain on the force from domestic missions is impacting the federal operational mission and recruiting and retention. Every time you have to go to that employer and say, I'm leaving, that that really uh, has an impact. Will you work with us on that and, and have NGB and, and, and work with NGB on us? No, absolutely. And one thing I'd, I'd add, Congressman, is we need to take a look as we move in the future. And I've talked to General Hokinson and General Jensen, and, and really, you know, we want the input from the Guard on, you know, as you know, certain states want to have certain type of units. Some are, you know, can raise special forces or can raise this type right. of organization. And, and some have talent and cyber and different type things. And so we want to work with the states and lay out, hey, can you do this? Can you put more here and, and, and do it in and, a collaborative And all of way. those factors absolutely should be factored in, but, yeah. you know, you, you can't have a tank unit there if you don't have the ranges, right? That's so right. That that's, should be all factored right. in. But population, particularly as they're shifting, and sure. that domestic mission, which I know isn't your number one priority, but it impacts uh, you. And, and, and further, you know, I think we need to look at what we're calling homeland defense. Right, I mean, that, our adversaries have made it clear with Colonial Pipeline and others 
that they can hit us here and will hit us here. Uh, and that, uh, when it impacts whole regions, I do would put that squarely uh, in your bucket and not in the governor's buckets necessarily. So that line is getting very blurry. Uh, and I would just ask your support in, in working with us on that. Shifting to the budget, um, I, I do think there's a narrative out there that as we shift to the Indo-Pacific, that's primarily an Air Force and Navy fight. And, and I know that there's a quarter million soldiers assigned just to Indo-Pacific COCOM. There's 60% of COCOM requirements are on your shoulders or on the Army's shoulders. But you know, as we have little recap uh, investments from the Middle East, the R&D budget is down, our O&M is stretched, the munitions budget is cut, increased demand on the Guard, as I mentioned. Madam Secretary, I'm having a hard time believing you have a sufficient budget. Are you testifying that you have a sufficient budget for all of those needs? Yes, Congressman. I, I think the budget that we have now is uh, adequate to provide us the resources that we need to, to both maintain our readiness, make sure that we can fulfill uh, current operational demands from the combatant commanders, and prepare for the future. Thank, thank you for that. Chief, you have enough money? Because I'll, I'll just note that your predecessors were always here demanding more uh, and fighting for more. Um, but Chief, you, you testify that you have enough? What I'm testifying to, um, Congressman, is you have my unfinanced requirements. I can tell you my priority when it comes to uh, the budget, and uh, we're giving you the best army we can with the budget that we received. Thank you, Chief. And in, in the few seconds I have uh, remaining, I just want to go to the physical requirements of combat. I applaud the move to a branch specific. Uh, um, it makes sense uh, to a branch specific physical requirement, and it makes sense. Infantry and artillery requires more than cyber or dentist. Madam Secretary, can you submit for the record your plans to maintain gender neutral uh, physical requirements or what you're looking at, at shifting it's towards? It's got to be yes or no. <laughs> we for, can, the record, we, for the record. We can certainly brief you on where we are with ACFT right now. Okay. Yes. Gentleman's time has Thank expired. You. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Bergman is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Secretary Warmoth, you have previously stated that the Army National Guard may not be able to fund training for the remainder of the fiscal year if supplemental funding is not provided to offset the cost of the capital security response. The Air National Guard is also in a similar position. Secretary Warmoth and uh, General McConville, uh, with a, just a simple yes or no answer, if supplemental funding isn't immediately approved, will guard readiness suffer? That is, will it be reduced? Yes, Congressman, it will. We'll have to cut training for uh, August and September. Yep. Yes, and I would add guard morale will also be affected because there's going to be guardsmen that are not going to get credit for this year's service if they don't get a chance to, to make the 39 days. And th that's a great point to dive into because not only do you affect the readiness, you affect the morale, and uh, to restate it, the, those who have committed to 20-plus years in the guard, a, a sat year, with the 50 points that enables them to, to have another qualifying year. This is, this is a big deal, so there should be no delay. Um, thank you for your response. Uh, Secretary Warmoth, um, in your view, what are the differences between command climate in garrison, uh, example, a base like Fort Hood, and command climate in a forward deployed unit engaged in kinetic activity that is combat? Well, Congressman, I would say, uh, for starters, I think, you know, to some extent, uh, and, and, you know, I've learned this in discussions with uh, commanders in our Army and in previous years uh, of working in the Pentagon, Often, you know, when you're, when you're there in combat or forward deployed, uh, potentially being ready for combat, um, you know, there's a crucible there where the command climate is often quite positive because commanders are um, right there with their soldiers. They know their soldiers. There's a shared sense of purpose and objective. I think, um, you know, at, at garrison, sometimes that can be more challenging. I mean, first of all, there's... So, I, and I don't want my... I mean, you're... You're on point. My question is, 
you know, unit commanders are selected, not elected. They're selected because they went through rigorous training, years of experience, and they're tasked with leadership, uh, both life and death, of their unit, whether it be in garrison or whether it be in the fight. And we talked earlier about the uh, general, as you mentioned, uh, in the last 20 years, um, a lot of our unit commanders, especially at the younger levels, have, when they've come back from deployment, have forgotten that they're still in, in charge of young soldiers and Marines and airmen. I mean, they're not bad people, they're just, they're, they're tired. They, and, and we know that in, when you're in command, you're in command day on, stay on, 24 7, 30 days a month, until appropriate relief, appropriately, you know, relieved of, of your command by, by, by someone else. I guess when I consider how we train and prepare our commanders, our, our officers, and senior enlisted for command. We are walking down a very unique road here, and not a good one, when we start separating things out of the command authority. Because you, you're either all in command of everything, or you're in command of nothing. And I believe the road we're walking down here, as we start separating out, an example, sexual assault, then what's next? So I would ask you to consider that as we move forward to make sure our troops are, number one, ready to fight, and number two, ready to care for each other, whether it be in garrison or in the fight. I yield back. Thank you. Ms. Spears, recognized for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Thank you both for your service. I will commend you, Ms. Warmoth, for your ability in a very short order to have a very commanding understanding of the issues that confront you. Um, let me start with what I am convinced is the next epidemic in the military, and that is uh, suicide. I just got word that the 11th, count it, the 11th suicide has taken place now in Alaska. Um, we have got to get a handle on this. So my first question is, will you please provide me with the number of suicides at each of our bases around the world? Yes, Congressman, we will. And uh, I agree with you, we have to get after this. Uh, I've been in the job four weeks, and I get emails every, every week, more than once, telling me that one of our soldiers has committed suicide. And it's extremely disheartening and tragic, and it, we need to focus on it more. So, uh, General McConville, the crushing, unsustainable op tempo, I think, is a major factor, not just in suicide. I think it was a major factor in the toxic climate at Fort Hood. And I'm concerned that this problem extends to other bases um, and to the rest of the Army. Last week, General Milley, testified before the committee, and he says the op tempo is too high. So what are you doing within the Army to address the op tempo and make it more manageable? Well, I, I absolutely agree with General, General Milley. I think one of the things that we learned from Fort Hood, when people look at Fort Hood, is the amount of deployments that they did. And, and you know, part of resources, we often talk about money here, is time. It's time for leaders to spend with their soldiers. It's time to get to know their soldiers. In many cases, uh, some of the soldiers that are having challenges are, can be left behind because the unit's going forward with them or without them. Uh, but building these cohesive teams, uh, and I use the, the, the model of the Golden Triangle where squad leaders know um, their soldiers and every soldier has a buddy and, every, and, and they know the families because when we look at these suicides, and I've, looked at them, I've been looking at this for a long time, it breaks my heart to lose people to suicide. It breaks my heart to lose any soldiers, but there's always something there about why did this soldier not you know, have the will to live? What would make them uh, be in that position where they no, want to, no longer want to live? And, and we have behavior health, my, my daughter does that. She's a behavior health officer in the Army right now trying to help out these young men and women. Uh, but there's something to do with connecting them, making them feel 
uh, connected. There's a okay, uh, General. I'm going to stop you there, yeah. unfortunately, because I have to ask a couple more questions. But okay. I appreciate your recognition that um, we have to address it. Uh, we have an unacceptable condition in many of our barracks and housing uh, across the military. You've heard from a number of members talk about housing in their various um, districts. Uh, at Fort Hood, um, in my number of visits there, uh, the barracks were, uh, some are being restored, some are not. Uh, the service member, the, the members of the committee that were on the CODEL who were uh, previously in the service were appalled at the condition of the barracks at Fort Hood. Now, there is a 10-year, $10, $10 billion plan to modernize the barracks within the Army. There's only been a request for $262 million for FY22. At this rate, you're never going to do $10 billion in 10 years. So it suggests that there isn't the commitment to making this a priority. So, Secretary, would you please comment on that? How you need to do a billion dollars a year to be able to make that commitment that you made of ten billion dollars over ten years? Thank you, Congresswoman. Um, I, I've been to, when I was at Fort Hood. I also had the opportunity to see the barracks, and uh, I saw good barracks, modernized barracks, but I also saw bad barracks. Um, what I would commit to you is, you know, we are, we do have the ten billion over ten year plan. What I would like to say to you is I will uh, look carefully at that plan because I myself, you know, particularly hearing all of the concerns that we are hearing about barracks, would like to dig into that and make sure that I feel satisfied that it, it is uh, going after modernizing barracks in a way that I feel comfortable with. And I have not looked at the 10-year plan in detail, so I will commit to do that and come back to you. All right, one last point. Uh, there's $485 million that's being spent on housing, family housing at Fort Hood. Um, but it is not a decision that the commander has any authority over um, based on the contracts we've and had. The general lady's decades. time ha ha has expired. Um, I'm going to recognize uh, Mr. Gates for the purposes of a UC request. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I ask unanimous consent for all committee members to have five legislative days with which to, mit to submit documents for the committee record. Hearing no objection, so ordered. Ms. Cheney is recognized. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you to uh, both uh, our witnesses for being here today. Uh, I wanted to talk uh, in a little bit more detail about uh, what we're seeing in terms of our adversaries' capabilities. Um, we've had multiple uh, testimonies over the course of our posture hearings this year, as we have in previous years. But this year in particular, um, comments like uh, the breathtaking speed with which we're watching the Chinese, for example, uh, modernize. Um, in the context that we're seeing uh, adversary capabilities increase, uh, this, the Biden administration defense budget is woefully insufficient, inadequate to uh, maintain our own capabilities. Uh, in, in your joint testimony, you said, uh, while America's army maintains a tenuous overmatch, it is fleeting. Uh, and I'd like to ask you first, uh, General McConville, we've heard this again year after year, this notion that it's, it's you know, we, we still got overmatched, but just barely. Uh, could you explain exactly what, what you mean by tenuous overmatch and on, on what basis, I understand in this setting it may be uh, less uh, specificity, but on what basis uh, you feel confident to say we still maintain tenuous overmatch. Yeah, Congress, what I, what I would say is uh, we're at an inflection point right now. So the systems that we basically developed in the 80s, um, you know, the big five weapon system, the Abrams and all those type systems, the doctrine we developed, the training centers, all those type things we developed, we've incrementally improved over the last 40 years. I think we're at a point right now where we must transform the Army to put us on a path to keep us the overmatch we need. So what I'm talking about, it's not just the, the six modernization priorities, which is the 31 plus four systems. It's new doctrine. It's joint all domain operations of how we're going to fight as a joint service. And I had a C to combine joint all, um, all domain operations because we're going to fight with our allies and partners. It's new organizations we're building, like the multi-domain task force. It's going to give us long-range precision effects, long-range precision fires. We need to have to penetrate this anti-access air denial capabilities developing. It's new ways we train, it's new ways that we bring things on board, and more importantly, it's, it's a 21st century talent management system where we manage people and compete for people very differently. All those things need to be done, 
And as we, as we discuss this, people are going to say, well, the barracks aren't this or this. You know, we, we, we are trying to take the money we have and apply it so we are postured the best we can with the money we've been given for the future. Well, I appreciate that, and I think that's a key point for the American people to understand, uh, that, that you're doing the best you can, but at this moment, our adversaries are not facing the same constraints. Um, in a contested environment, General, today, do you think that the joint force would have dominance across the entire spectrum? I do. Because uh, two years ago, in 2018, um, as, as the Army began to change the doctrine, um, the, there, there was testimony at that time that, in fact, then we, we, we would not have. But do you think that we've now uh, increased our capacities and our capabilities, that they've improved since 2018? I think, I think we have. I think we're on a good path right now. I feel comfortable with the, the Army we have. I, I spent a lot of time talking to allies and partners and, and moving around, and I've, I've, I've fought with this Army, and I feel pretty comfortable uh, that we're on the right path with the Army we have. And, and again, I think where we're going is going to give us uh, not the tenuous overmatch. I think it's going to give us significant overmatch we need for the future. Well, I would also just uh, urge that we, we can't get to that significant overmatch if we don't have the resources, and, and time is not on our side. Uh, and I appreciated your comments about whole of government, but, but again, I come back to the notion that, that deterrence fundamentally uh, requires that our adversaries understand we have the capability and the will, uh, and that's the military capability and the will. Um, uh, and so, uh, Secretary Warmoth, could you explain how you are thinking about deterrence in new ways? Because it seems pretty clear that, that being able to depend upon overmatch, being able to depend upon dominance uh, across every domain uh, isn't uh, where we're headed uh, with this budget. So what are the new thinking, the new ways you're thinking about effective deterrence in that world? Congresswoman, I would say a couple of things. Um, first of all, I think one you know, area of overmatch that we have is our relationships with allies and partners. Uh, and you know, I firmly believe that part of our deterrent uh, is going to be signaling clearly that we have friends that China doesn't have in the theater, for example, who would be willing to be with us. And the Army has put a lot of emphasis and I think is well positioned to um, strengthen and thicken that network of relationships of allies and partners. I think uh, another area that we need to work on and that we are working on with things like our artificial intelligence integration my, center. My time has expired, Secretary. I, I look forward to continuing that discussion. I think that, that there's no amount of allies, though, that can substitute uh, if we allow our adversaries to get ahead of us from a, a capability sure, time has expired. Uh, Mr. Morelli is recognized for five minutes. I think you're still muted, um, Ms. Morelli. Could you try and unmute yourself? Mm. All right. Uh, Mr. Kim is recognized for five minutes. We'll try to get back to Ms. Morelli. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you to the two of you for coming on out. It's great to see the both of you again. Uh, I, I wanted to start with you, Secretary Warmoth. Um, the about a week ago, a little over a week ago, though, there was an article in the Washington Post about hunger concerns in our military, um, in particular with Guard and Reservists, saying that there, uh, you know, there are increasing data showing that there, there's hunger and food insecurity amongst our service members and their families. In that same article, there was a spokesperson for the Guard that said that he was skeptical about the food insecurity census data and that he had not encountered service members who have complained of household hunger. So I, I guess I just wanted to kind of get a sense of how the Department of Defense and how you, how you see this. Is this a problem that you're aware of, or do you feel like it's something that's under control? Thank you, Congressman, and it's good to see you. Um, I think, you know, this is not an area that I've been able to dig in extensively in terms of having a lot of analytical data, but certainly I've heard anecdotally some expressions of concern about food insecurity. And I think if you look at the, 
you know, our military families have suffered a lot of hardships during this past year with COVID, as have uh, millions of Americans. And so it's entirely possible to me that there may be families, you know, with spouses who have lost their jobs, for example, that may be contributing to this. I think what we're trying to do uh, for starters, certainly, is to make sure that we're providing educational resources to our soldiers and their families to help them with things like financial planning, to make sure that they know what resources are available um, to help them with food insecurity if they are struggling. Well, I appreciate your, your response and the way that you approached it because I, I think that this is something that clearly we all need to look into more and try to figure out what it is that we can understand. I mean, I look at the priorities in your testimony of saying that you know, your top priorities are about investing in people and sustaining ready, readiness. And certainly, I think you know, investing in people and sustaining readiness you know, starts with making sure that we have our service members and their families being able to have what they need to be able to, uh, to be healthy. Um, so I was a little alarmed by just the skepticism that was kind of laid out by that one spokesperson. So I'd love to be able to continue to work with you on this because I want to tell you is from my end, I have, you know, we have indications and we have reports in my district of community service organizations needing to provide food assistance to dozens of service member families in my district and it's been getting worse. So this is something that I've been worried about for quite a few months, and I just feel like this is something we need to address. I think we can all agree that no one in uniform should go hungry. I mean, I'd love to say no one in America should go hungry. I think that's something as well that we recognize, but uh, those that protect us. In that same vein, one, another thing that I'd like to just get on your radar uh, may not be something you're, you're tracking right at the forefront, uh, but um, you know, there, there's a piece of legislation that I'm trying to work for with my colleague Trent Kelly uh, called the Healthcare for Our Troops Act. And if you don't mind, kind of take a look at this. But it's the same kind of approach. It's saying that right now we have over 120,000, if not more, guard and reservists wearing a uniform that don't have health care. And that seems like a huge problem. That seems like a readiness issue. That seems like a problem in terms of just treating people with decency and be, especially those that are there to try to protect us. So I just wanted to get it on your radar and, and would love to be able to follow up with you. But I think you would agree, Secretary, that again, anyone that wears a uniform should be able to have the food that they need, to be able to provide for their family, and certainly, when they're certainly putting themselves in harm, way, should have the health care that they need to. Is that correct? Yes, Congressman. And as, as you know, um, you know, when our guardsmen, uh, soldiers, men or women, are mobilized, you know, particularly for a, a length of time beyond 30 days, I believe, they, they do qualify for uh, health care insurance in that, uh, in that phase. But there are certainly some who, you know, if they don't have civilian employer coverage, health care can be a challenge. So that is certainly something I would like to look into with you. I think that's something that we can we can deliver for them, especially given what they've done. I mean, we, we look at what Guard and Reservists have done over the last year, all the different mission sets we've been pushing them towards. So I'd love to be able to work with you on that. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. I'll yield back. Thank you. Um, votes have been called. Um, Mr. Kim, could you do me a favor and stick around for like five? I hate to do this publicly, but I got to run and vote and come back. We need someone around the committee. I'll go and do that. Um, Mr. Bacon, you're recognized for five minutes. I'll be right back. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you, Ranking Member. Madam Secretary and General McConville, you're both doing a great job today, so I appreciate your leadership. Most of my questions are directed to the general. Uh, first, on long-range fires, there is a need. China has an asymmetrical advantage, uh, but I'm a big believer or proponent for the B-21 and the Navy long-range fires. That's not to say there's not a place for the Army uh, version here. My concern is housing and basing. Are we confident we can find countries in the Indo-PACOM region that will take these weapon systems? I, I, think, I think, Congressman, that um, you know, we take a look around, around the world, and uh, I, I don't want get, to get ahead of certain countries because their politics may not be such, but I know one country that a lot of people thought that we couldn't get troops into, and at one time, based on their interests, there were 500,000 troops there. So I think things can change, and what we're looking at is providing that option. There are some places where we certainly can get uh, that capability uh, as set, and then as far as um, the, the ability to actually base that, that that'll discussion that we'll, we'll have to have. But I, I don't want to get in front of some of our allies and partners, especially uh, in this environment. Well, I see a need. I just hate to, well, I hate to see it undercut two other long-range capabilities that we know we could find basing 
forward. But I just think that's the long pole in the tent. And I, I'd be glad to discuss it probably in another venue. I think okay. it would be worthwhile to have that discussion because there's, there's, it's, it's worthy of discussion. And I think from a military standpoint, uh, we should not limit ourselves to some of the options, especially when we're taking a look at what we see the future threat, at least from where I sit. Well, I think multiple angles of attacking capability are needed. So I, I would be sympathetic. When it comes to Taiwan, what more can we do to improve deterrence there? Because day one of China attacking is a day too late. What we do now is deterrence. Well, if, if, if I think from a, a Taiwan standpoint, um, you know, them having the appropriate capabilities and capacities is a fairly large uh, country. But I mean, when you think about what, the, if, if I was to give them advice, anti-access air denial, how do, you, how do you get that? You get that with an integrated air and missile defense capability, and you get that with some type of anti-amphibious capability, and, and I would make sure they had that. I'm totally with you, uh, absolutely. And I think we have to work now to ensure they have access to these capabilities. Also, I just want to say I agree with your concerns about removing commanders' case to position authority. Um, I think I'm a five-time commander in the Air Force myself. Having two chain of commands uh, cr would create friction and concerns, I believe. I think it undermines the cohesion uh, of a squadron. But if we're going to do it, we should limit it to Article 120 offenses. So can you elaborate on your proposal to make changes on a three-day trial basis and why this would be beneficial to the force? A three-day, I'm not sure. I, three, are you talking about the, the uh, Secretary Inhofe letter? Is that the one? Right, you're correct. Asking? I Thank guess, you. I guess from where I'm, you know, I'm a, I'm a believer in commanders. Uh, they certainly had an opportunity to give best military advice both to you all and to the Secretary of Defense. And, you know, there, there's going to be a position coming forward. I trust commanders. Commanders are going to implement these type of things. And uh, at the same time, there's going to be a decision made on what's the best way to get after that. And once that decision is made, since I've had my chance to give my best military advice, I will follow that decision. Thank you. And I, I appreciate your position on it as a five-time commander. I'm, I agree with you. Uh, right now we're involved with Poland with the uh, Enhanced Forward Presence mission there. I, I worry about the Baltics. I'm the chairman of the Baltic Security Caucus. I think they're most, that's the most vulnerable area when it comes to NATO and Russia. What more can we do to also improve deterrence for the Baltic states? Uh, Congressman, one thing I think we can do, and the, the chief I think uh, alluded to this a little bit in his discussion earlier about special forces, is really provide, you know, I, I think there's, um, we want the Baltics to, to present a deterrent to Russia. And I think part of what we can do in the Army is have our special operations forces work with the Baltic militaries to help them in terms of, you know, frankly, developing kind of potentially resistance, what I would call resistance capabilities. And I think the Balts can do that uh, relatively inexpensively, but they would benefit, I think, quite a bit from our expertise and, um, you know, deep knowledge base with our special forces. Let me, let me just close by saying I, we have a rotating units going in and out of the Baltics. I would sure like to see a more permanent present if they were amenable to it. Because I think it makes deterrence more assured uh, if you're coming from the perspective of the Russians. But I'm out of time, so I have to yield back. Thank you. Gentleman yields back. We're going to turn it over to Mr. Morelli. Mr. Morelli, over to you. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you to uh, Secretary the General for being here and for your testimony for your service to our country. Uh, Secretary uh, Warman, I wanted to uh, go back and, and follow up a little bit on the line of questioning my colleague, uh, Representative Horsford, uh, began with some time ago regarding weapons accountability. Um, and having read uh, some of the articles on this question, uh, gun safety is critically important uh, to all of us as Americans. And given the recent spike in violence, um, much of it with illegal weapons, I wanted to uh, just follow up on the task force that you said the Army had set up. And I look forward to tracking the progress and the recommended changes uh, it was a little concerning to me. I think there was a significant discrepancy in the number of missing weapons reported in the Associated Press uh, articles versus what the task force has found. I think there was about a discrepancy of maybe 500 or more weapons. And I wondered if um, looking, if, first of all, to just figure out whether the task force is going to look at that discrepancy and try to understand uh, what's caused it and 
to look at the trends of the loss of weapons is the task force also addressing um, how to make sure that reported losses in the future are, are accurate? Thank you, Congressman. Uh, yes, there, you're right. There is a discrepancy between the figure that the Associated Press has reported and what, we're, what we have found to date uh, based on the documentation that the Army has available to it. And certainly we will look into that to understand the nature of that discrepancy. I'm not intimately familiar with the, with the records, if you will, that the Associated Press based its reporting on. Um, but but we will look into that, and we are certainly trying to you know use the most authoritative documentation that's available to the Army to keep track of this. And if there are systemic issues that arise, we will absolutely develop recommendations to address them. And I'd be happy to discuss that with you at the at that time. Uh, I appreciate that, and I, and I would say that I think the report suggests that they feel like the number that they have may even be undercounted. And it's certainly not just the Army. Uh, they uh, acknowledge the other services as well. Um, I appreciated hearing um, you say how trained soldiers are to be responsible and that the entire unit focuses on retrieval. The fact that the weapons are going missing, uh, I'm sure to you and to me and to most people who read the articles uh, is concerning. Is the task force considering changes in training to ensure greater accountability and uh, reduce loss on the part of soldiers? Congressman, I don't think the task force has yet, you know, come to conclusions about what the key shortfalls are or, you know, areas that are problematic. But if, if, if our work reveals that we need to um, change or increase our training to make sure we've got accountability, we will do that. Great. And I, I would just leave you with this, and I appreciate your candor, and I recognize you're probably just getting into uh, looking at, uh, at the subject. But uh, I'm just hoping that we that we'll certainly have accurate reporting, that there'll be transparency. And lastly, um, given the 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 number of uh, reported violent incidents around the country, some of them involving weapons that are are being obtained uh, from the military, uh, I, I would certainly uh, hope that we'll have um, continued communication between uh, the Army and the Congress about just the nature of the problem, what's being done, and, and whether or not we're able to make uh, some inroads in addressing it. So uh, thank you for your testimony, for all your good work, and I uh, yield back, Mr. Chair. Next, we're going to call on, if he's available, Rep. Scott. Well, uh, thank you so much. Right now, as you know, we're in the middle of votes, so uh, we're certainly uh, having a few members kind of scrounge around. So, uh, but I wanted to thank the two of you for coming here and for us to be able to have this conversation um, so incredibly important as we're thinking through here some of our next steps and to make sure that we're giving our military the resources that they need to be as strong as they are. So I appreciate your service there, and we're going to gavel out on this hearing. Thank you so very much.